What's up guys? Mustafa here, or on YouTube, uh, The Flying Moose. And uh, we're going to be doing a uh, tutorial flight today on uh, how to the MD-80, specifically the Leonardo MD-80X. And um, this is a, a, a fantastic flight model that Leonardo has done originally for FSX and, and uh, more recently now for a P3D, which is what we're going to be looking at it in. Uh, just so you know, uh, my sim here, this is a P3D V4. Uh, 0.5 and uh, with the latest and greatest and, and there's some add-ons too that we have that aren't just stock sim for instance we're using active sky for our weather injection we're using uh, rex um, sky force for our um, uh, texturing uh, obviously the uh, the md80 itself is an add-on we're actually at phoenix sky harbor uh, by flight beam and uh but there we go. <laughs> and so uh, this is obviously not stock default either. And then uh, we're going to be flying to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth today for the uh, purposes of the tutorial. And that is um, by FS Dream Team. We also have GSX, which you'll uh, see down here. Uh, and working with the aircraft in a little bit, um, that is uh, also by FS Dream Team. So a number of other add-ons uh, throughout the sim. We can talk about those later. Uh, but the purpose of this uh uh, tutorial today is to teach you how to operate this aircraft uh, as close as I can anyway lend you to uh, do so for uh, from from the uh, as far as the real world would be concerned uh, I'm just as a <laughs> uh, caveat here I am not an actual airline pilot I'm not an actual MD-80 pilot and um, and never have been in that sense I have uh, flown real world aircraft before but uh, nothing bigger than a Cessna so uh, my experience comes from uh, actually working with this plane, working with the manuals, working with other tutorials, uh, gleaning from uh, other real-world sources and real-world videos and seeing how the, uh, the professionals uh, handle this. There will be things that I do that are not correct, so <laughs> that's just the way it is, but this will teach you how to uh, ac uh, fairly accurately fly this aircraft consistently. Uh, and in a way that uh, can get you from point A to point B, uh, while providing a, a modicum of realism. Let's put it that way. So uh, let's just look, look at the aircraft for a second here. We'll give you an overview, and then I'm going to take the camera away as we get onto the flight deck so it doesn't impede the, the uh, actual controls, because there's no reason to look at my face for this. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I choke on something uh, in the back of my throat. Uh, so the aircraft is a tail-mounted uh, engined aircraft with a T-tail uh, because of the tail mounted engines um, and so one of the uh, one of the things you want to be careful with a, a t-tail aircraft is is uh, over rotation uh, because if you get uh, if you get that tail down in the uh, the, the wind stream of the or the the flow of over the wing from the, the wings here you can really get yourself in a world of hurt and have trouble uh, pushing that nose back down and stalling the aircraft. So um, 727 had the same issue. Uh, the MD-80 does too. So just uh, be careful when you're, uh, when you're hand flying this thing. Uh, this MD-80 though has a, a quite a bit of power with these two uh, 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 Pratt Whitney uh, JT eight D's, I believe is what's on these things. And uh, fantastic sound. Uh, the sounds actually are not stock with the Leonardo. Um, the, I, I found the stock sounds uh, lacking, so I have a Turbine Sound Studios uh, sounds for the MD-80 and absolutely love them. So, um, Tricycle style gear, just the nose gear and then two, two main gears with two tires on each of the main gears. Uh, the wings, fairly standard, very low wings uh, with flaps and ailerons as you would assume, as you would uh, as you would normally expect. Uh, the landing lights, by the way, I think it's this guy here, which I'm not gonna get too close, um, is uh, comes out of the wing, extends down, and actually will provide you a little bit of, uh, of drag. So you can actually use the landing lights to your advantage to uh, help slow the aircraft down when you're trying to descend. So you'll notice this uh, livery is not a standard uh, airline livery. This is a Westwind livery for the uh, airline, virtual airline that I fly for. Um, normally and if you're familiar with my channel then you're very familiar with Westwind. Uh, speaking of which I do stream I have this YouTube channel obviously that you've already found because you're watching this video but I do stream on Twitch uh, every week uh, at least three days a week sometimes more depending on what's uh, going on but uh, this, uh, details are right there on the screen for you uh, Thursdays Fridays and Saturdays Thursday Friday evenings and Saturday uh, mornings is the typical stream schedule check me out on Twitch twitch.tv slash Mustafa and uh, you can find me there and then you can also uh, follow me on social media to flying moose 83 uh, at either Facebook Instagram or Twitter happy to uh, see ya
All right, so let's go ahead and get in the cockpit of this thing and get this thing going. I'll show you how to how I operate this aircraft, and hopefully it will help you fly this aircraft too. So I'm going to get rid of the camera now. So a goodbye to all of you once I figure out where the – there it is. And we're going to go ahead and hop into the aircraft. I am using Chase Plane for my views. That makes moving around the cockpit quite a bit easier. I use a hat switch on my uh, on my yoke to uh, – to move my head around and then I have a number of views set up in chase plane so I can easily jump around the cockpit uh, quickly and easily and that is a big help when flying a complex airliner by yourself normally there are two of you to fly this aircraft in the real world and in the sim there's just one of us so you actually have a, a your work cut out for you uh, especially with an aircraft uh, of this. So the first thing we notice here in the aircraft uh, is if you're used to Boeing, if you're used to Airbus, this air, this uh, cockpit, this flight deck does not uh, kind of look typical of either one of those. It's kind of a hodgepodge, it looks like, especially when you look at the overhead panel. It just looks like a mess. And this can be uh, very overwhelming if the, if you don't are familiar with the McDonnell Douglas aircraft. And even if you have experience with like the MD-11 or something like that, uh, that even is much more digital and even seems more intelligently laid out than this does. This will make sense as we go through this, but um, on first glance, you kind of go, oh my gosh, how am I going to how am I gonna do this? So, uh, but don't worry, we're going to break it down for you <clears throat> and make it fairly simple. And uh, so first thing we're going to do when we get on this aircraft is we are going to uh, get power on the aircraft. And I'm going to take you through the flows that I do. They are not necessarily the exact flows that normal pilots would go through but it will cover all the same things and it does so for me in a way that um, I can remember where I've been and what I've done so so but power is always the first thing so your uh, battery and APU controls are right here in the center and so you're going to click the battery button and you're going to click it one more time that will lock it down and you'll start to see some things come online not a whole lot will activate at this point, but we have some lights, some Master Caution lights. You're going to hear in the background some light uh, avionic sounds clicking on. And uh, <clears throat> it's at this point that we're going to want to put external power on the aircraft. Now, you could also start the APU at this point. Um, if you wanted to do that, um, you would need to turn on the start pump right here. This would allow fuel to get to the uh, APU un with the under battery power, which is all you have right now. And then the APU master switch would be run and start, and you'd hold start until you see the EGT gauge on the APU start to come alive, then you can let that go. Once that fires all the way up, um, you'll be able to click on the APU buses, you'll see an APU power uh, available light here. Now, we're going to turn the APU on later, but normally you would not turn the APU on necessarily to save uh, fuel. If you can avoid it, you'd use the external power provided outside, and that's what we're going to do until we get everybody loaded up and ready to go. So, we're going to come over here. And we need to do, actually, no, I'm sorry, it's up here. There's two different PA things, and i got to remember which one they are. I'm going to, uh, let's see, do this to be able to show you better. So this is the overhead panel. Up here is the maintenance interphone. This is the connection between you and the ground. So we're going to turn that to on. Once we've done that, this is the mechanic call right here. And if you right-click on that, you get this thing and you hear the mechanic go yeah what do you want it's so gonna say connect ground power unit connect the GPU please stand by let's say stand by and then I also go through here and I tell them to connect yes, the air connect conditioning the as well air, please. so that's just a big giant in tube that stand you'll by. see sometimes a big yellow tube that's inflated outside the aircraft uh, that's just pushing air into the um, the aircraft to provide air conditioning while the aircraft's on the ground okay here comes pressure so normally I would do this by just looking up here. I want to kind of show you, but you'll see up here once that's clicked on. So here's you go. So this is the external power. So this is APU we were talking about earlier. So now the APU is available, and you can turn on the right bus, and you hear a lot of stuff click on. And we can also use this opportunity, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to switch the emergency power on right there. So emergency power in use. And I want to see. I'm just going to turn those on enough to see them because I think this will then turn off. No, nope, maybe not. I thought it was those guys. Maybe not. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure what that does. So basically, we're just checking to see the, the emergency power in use uh, spot. Maybe just check to make sure that light comes on. <laughs> 
All right, turn the other uh, external bus on, and now this will. Now the aircraft is fully powered. Uh, you're running off uh, the external uh, connections instead of the APU or instead of the engines, but uh, either way, everything is powered. Now you notice I had to turn on these screens. We'll go through here and do this as a check. I just wanted to turn them on to get them started to see if that was going to do what I was going to think it was going to do, but it didn't, so I don't care. <laughs> All right, so once we've established uh, power in the aircraft, uh, we're going to go ahead and over here, this uh, large silver button, or no uh, knob, or switch, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> is, the, uh, is the navigation lights outside. Clicking them down one more will turn on the strobes, and we don't want to do that until we're actually on the runway, but we do want the nav lights on whenever the aircraft is powered. So we're going to turn that on real quick, and that's the only thing we're going to do and then we're going to come up and, and accomplish a whole bunch of stuff on this overhead panel to get the aircraft uh, kind of ready to go. The one thing I am going to do before we go on, though, is I'm going to tell GSX to come and fuel us up. So we're going to say request refueling, because <clears throat> I want to get that going, because we do need to have GSX uh, top off our tanks. So, uh, All right, so starting up here uh, at the top, we already set up the uh, panel to do with the maintenance interphone, so we don't need to worry about that. But if we come down here, in fact, let's do it this way so you guys can see better what I'm doing. Uh, basically, you want to make sure these are the, the switches for the various um, instrumentations. These should all be, always be up in normal. And so you're just making sure they're all up. Uh, the flight recorder, you can... I don't think there's anything you can really do with this. Yeah, the testing doesn't... I don't think this is functional, so you don't really do anything with that. Um, this is your electrical panel, and just for habit, because every once in a while, one of these breakers like doesn't set right and so I will come up here and I will reset them all since they're not in use anyway Oops. and then switch them back to all on and norm so basically what will happen is as the engines start now they'll automatically engage the generators when it's when it spins up to appropriate speed and same thing with the APU when it spins up we'll get the APU power available um, every once in a while you'll start the APU and this will never fire and you'll go what is going on and you come down here and you have to hit this reset and so I just do it ahead of time just to make sure everything's fine and dandy. We're gonna go ahead and turn on galley power since we're on external power we got plenty of power. We want to make sure the AC bus tie and the DC bus ties are both open or sorry are auto and open rather. That'll keep the system separate unless they're needed to be combined. And then we come down here, the uh, start pump will be off right now because we're not using the APU. The ignition system is off, we're not starting anything. Fuel heat should be off, starters should be guarded. All the fuel tank pumps should be off. Uh, on the emergency lights, we're going to actually turn the emergency lights on. And then we're going to come down here and we're going to turn on, you want to make sure the uh, PA interphone and uh, VH1, VHF1 at least is on here. But we're going to hit PA right here. And we're going to right click on the attendant call and do the PA emergency light test. PA and emergency light test. And they're going to call us back and tell us the emergency lights are working. And it tests the PA. Emergency lights okay. All right, emergency lights are okay, so we switch that back to arm. And then don't forget to switch that back to VHF1 cuz otherwise you're on VATSIM and you're trying to talk to them and you can't figure out why you can't do it. That's why. <laughs> um no smoke sign on. No seat The seatbelt sign will keep off because we're going to be refueling. So as long as you're refueling, you always keep that off. And then once the refueler is gone, we can turn that back on. While we're down here, we're going to select the pedo indicators through all of its positions. And we're just checking to make sure we have indication on everything except the rat probe. That's the only thing we shouldn't get on the ground. And then once we do that, we select it back to off because we don't want those pedos running on the ground until we're ready to move. So that's just a check of the system. Um, all the airfoil and engine and windshield anti-ice stuff can be off except for windshield anti-ice. Uh, that is your window heat, and you want to get that started up and going, and so we'll turn that on now. Come back up here to the top. Uh, again, flight recorder stuff you don't need to mess with. Engine sync selector should be off, and then we need to do the uh, ground proximity warning test. Flight slow. Let that go, and you'll get Pull a couple indications. Terrain. Terrain. Once that's finished, we're going to do the wind shear test. Headwind, shear, headwind, shear, headwind, shear. Tailwind, shear, tailwind, shear, tailwind, shear. 
And then these are uh, optional lights. Uh, we're flying during the day right now, so I'm not going to turn any of them on. But this is your big one. This is the, the main dome light that you would use if it was dark. Thunderstorm light, if you're getting lightning outside at night and it's blinding you, you turn that on, turn a bunch of cockpit lights on. Circuit breaker panel lights and standby compass lights, if you need them, you can turn those on. Coming down here, same thing, this is the tail logo light. It's the daytime, so we're not going to turn that on. But we will come across here and we'll do the uh, speed test. Test the stall system. And then we're going to, on the anti-skid, I'm going to pan down here enough so I can see the the displays down here. And we're going to set arm, we're going to hold down test. And you see all the anti-skid indications come up, and then we let that go, they should disappear. And we leave anti-skid and armed. Yaw damper will go on, and uh, mock trim it should be a normal. And then ice FOD, foreign object debris test, we're going to do the same thing, hold test. Look for the indications, and let it go when we see them. And then we should see those go away. So that's good. Um, down here, the uh, radio rack, you want it on fan on the ground because we don't have any air flowing, so the Venturi system would not be a smart way to go. You could use that in the air if the fan failed, but we just keep it on fan. Um, you do have air conditioning connected, but it's not being done by the packs. It's being done externally by that big tube, so these remain off. This is the air conditioning panel here. We're just going to verify that it is off and good to go. Air conditioning shutoff override switch should be in auto. The RAM air system can, should be off for the time being. And then over here, we're going to slip this up, standby, back to primary, and then click that to cut out. This just kind of resets the system. Uh, we'll go ahead and put in our landing altitude and stuff in a little bit. But for the initial pre-flight, we just want to run that through its checks, and then we'll set the rest of it in a moment. Uh, we're going to come down here, and uh, you have to hold the uh, enunciator light. Now, I move my mouse away, and I'm still holding the left mouse button, even though my, my thing's not on the screen, but it allows me to move around, but I'm still holding the left mouse button. If I let go, it undoes the test. So you want to hold it, you don't have to keep it over it, but just keep holding that mouse button. And you're checking for all of your lights, basically. We're going to look down here, around the cockpit, we should see those master caution lights, we've got the uh, uh, vertical speed with the TCAS displays, the flight, um, the autopilot displays basically here engine instruments, they're basically all just running through these tests to show you all the indications and you just want to make sure you don't see anything obviously burned out. So once that's done you can let that go. Uh, we don't need to do anything with the rain wipers and the flight deck door right now is auto unlock. When we get ready to go we'll switch over to deny and back to auto and, we'll, and that will just extinguish. Alright, and that is everything we have to do right now with the overhead panel. So once we finish the overhead panel we come down here to the side and we're going to look at the uh, oxygen uh, panel and Oops, stop that and we're just going to flip that back and forth when you turn that on and then flip that back and forth to make sure we have flow over here is the this is another chance to double check and make sure you're back on uh, VHF1 for your microphone and then these are the indications to change the uh, ND down here so from uh, compass rows to arc to map to plan mode uh, ADF controls and then the range selector. Now there's a shortcut way to do this too, I'll show you in a little bit, but just know that's where the actual buttons are and then uh, for populating that display with other things like airport data, just ready data waypoints, things like that, you can do that there. Coming down here, uh, we'll set our lights and so I usually turn the uh, panel lighting at least up in the daytime to uh, 12 o'clock noon. Um, if it was darker outside, I would turn on some floodlights to just illuminate the panel a little bit. You've got uh, floor lights down here if you need to illuminate the floor, so you can feel free to do that. Uh, your static air selector should be a normal, not alternate. And uh, that's the clock behind there. You just want to verify that the uh, clock indication is correct. Um, coming across here, this is where, if I hadn't already, we would turn up our uh, displays. So by default, in cold and dark mode, these displays are all off. And so you just rotate these two guys right here, and the outer knob is the ND. The inner knob of this one is your weather radar. So obviously you won't see anything right now, but if you don't turn that on, you turn your weather radar on, and you wonder why you're flying through storms and nothing's coming up, that's probably because that thing's just all the way off. So be aware of that. You also have a test right here that you can run on those displays, and you'll hear that little woo. And then uh, this is your uh, your decision height selector right here. So I see DH right there. And we'll leave that zero because we're not landing right now. We're going to be taking off of anything. 
coming over here to the standby artificial horizon, you want to cage this, and so you pull this knob out. And sometimes you have to do it a few times to get it to, to center and equalize right there. And then that is done. Uh, we'll also be putting in our uh, current altimeter settings. We'll get that in a little bit, and I'll show you a cool trick. You can do that with the uh, ACAR system on this thing, which is kind of cool. As we come across here, we want to test our fire system. So you, this is, again, you push and hold, and then come over here and push with your right click, right mouse button. So you're actually holding your both your left and right mouse button when you do this. Fire, left engine. Fire, right engine. And then let them go. Now, because you clicked another button after you did this, you have to come back up here and click this again. You're going to get a uh, uh, in, an indication up here about a fire loop thing going on because that loop is closed, and I'll show you where you can see that out in a little bit. Um, the uh, ART switch should be in auto for right now until we make the call of whether or not we're going to do a reduced thrust takeoff or not, so just leave that as it is, but just default that to auto. Uh, these should all be in the off position. You can test this real quick and just make sure you have that indication right there and let that go. And this should go back. Uh, fuel quantity, we will check that in a moment and make sure... Um, we're all fueled up. In fact, we probably are fueled up by now. Um, so, in fact, why don't we do this? I'm going to go ahead and call for boarding so we're not waiting an eternity. Because we might as well, because I don't see that filling up anymore, which means we are we should be good. Um, so you would check, we would we could need to check these numbers right here and make sure they, uh, they look correct. So um, I'm going to go down here and look at my uh, takeoff data here. And it's pretty close. 117.450. Yeah, that's just, so that's right. Yeah, let's gross weight. Okay. So, the, uh, 20, I think 20, what was I supposed to have fuel wise? 26.6. We have 26.550. Yeah, so we're loaded with fuel. So these, these numbers are correct. Yeah. All right. So we just want to verify our fuel. And we've got 90, 9250 in each of the side tanks and 8,000 in the center tank. These are in pounds, by the way. Um, you'll want to, if you're in the States, I think it defaults to kilograms the first time you get this aircraft. So if you're if you're used to pounds and you want to stick with pounds, uh, you have to go into your load manager with Leonardo and change that and then reload the aircraft. Otherwise, you're going to do a lot of conversions on your phone to try and figure out what the heck that means. <laughs> so uh, we're not going to mess with the, uh, the uh, CDUs yet. The, or, or the weather or the weather radar. Um, you want to verify that your spoilers are down, <clears throat> your flaps are up, your throttles are idle, and your fuel is cut off. And I think right now we can do this. Yes, this is going to test our takeoff warning. All right, so we just run those through there and just make sure we get all those indications. Those are the <clears throat> the the four or five things that it's going to be looking for and if any one of those is out of its takeoff position it will give you that warning the the beep followed by what the problem is if you thrust up on takeoff and you hear that go immediately throttle back and figure out what you didn't do you are not taking off at that point <laughs> so just know that um, the other thing you want to do this uh, the aircraft is this is pretty cool it will do this for you but I'll, I'll show you how to calculate this yourself as well so right here, you have this big green indication. This is how you figure out your trim in this aircraft uh, for takeoff. So um, I'm going to show you on the weight and balance here. This is the load manager for Leonardo. And it gives you right here your um, CG based on your load. So we, we did this already. We have 144 passengers we're taking today. Our cargo loads and everything like that. Here's our zero fuel weight, 117.5. And then our fuel load out roughly, you know, 8,864. It, does a little bit of rounding um that's fine but so our our end up our takeoff cg and we have to make sure obviously our takeoff cg and our zero fuel cg are within the acceptable limits uh which we are but 11.6 uh, is the the magic number right there so when actually when you hit this button right here it will send all this information to the aircraft it will actually move this for you but if it ever doesn't here's how you would do this yourself so you have over here a cg side of this wheel and a flap side so right now it's assuming we're going to do a flaps 15 takeoff and our cg is 11.6 and that has computed that our trim needs to be between 0.7 and 0.8 right in here and that has moved this green lever so what we do is we take our electronic trim and i'm doing this on my yoke and I'm moving it down. You can't can barely see it moving right here behind the suitcase handles here. 
that noise is just the indicator that the uh, stabilizer trim is moving. You'll get that whenever it moves. It's not a uh, indication that you're doing something wrong. It's just a an aural warning so you know that it's moving because it's very important to know that the aircraft trim is moving when you're flying the plane. But you're just going to bring these two things in sync with each other and, and just as long as it's relatively close, um, you're looking just to make sure they're they're together right there. And now your trim is set for takeoff. Really cool. Simple as that. If you were going to do flaps 11 takeoff, then you would rotate this to flaps 11. It would recalculate this for you, and and off you go. You do that again. So, so just make sure that's set. Uh, come down here, transponder. If we were flying online, which I'm not today because I'm doing a tutorial, we would uh, get our uh, our squat code from ATC. When I don't have a squat code, um, you typically are uh, in the in the um, VFR world. You're squat 1200 for VFR. So because we're an IFR flight, I make this 2200. Just add a 2 instead of a 1, and that's how I do mine. So you can put any code you want in here. If you're not flying online, you can make up numbers, whatever you want to do. But um, that's a transponder code that uh, ATC will give you. Uh, then the other thing is you can turn up, I think it's this one. No, it's not. They, they move these around a little bit, and it always throws me off. Okay, there we go. So that just brings up the uh, the lighting in the standby, cock, in the standby instruments. Again, I could put in some flood lighting if it was going to be dark, um, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm also going to come over here real quick and turn on the uh, FO's instruments. Real quick like. I don't turn on the FO's weather radar only because I don't need to see it over there and it's just less things for the sim to load. I don't need it twice. So I leave his alone. But, uh, but you can turn it on if you want, but I leave it alone. Um, the other thing I do over here as far as the uh, final uh, cockpit check procedures is I will obviously verify that the uh, trim is uh, centered here and the trim is centered here. This is uh, aileron trim and rudder trim. But um, I will also turn uh, open the uh, pneumatic crossfeed uh, levers here. This will allow you to start your engines. This is a big uh, overlooked item by people trying to start the Mad Dog and can't figure out why the engines won't start. These must be up. <laughs> and then after you start, you put them back down to separate the, the, the pneumatic feeds, the, the, the air bleed. Um, in case of a fire or something like that, you don't want it all crossing over. But during engine start, those need to be up. So I'm going to turn those on. And that's the initial um, procedure I do for that. Um, I basically leave this all alone until um, we do the, the flight, the flight plan here. So we're going to do that now. That people are uh, loading up and getting ready to go. We're going to come down to the other big mysterious part of uh, any aircraft like this, and that is the uh, CDU, the uh, FMC, um, whatever you want to call it. This is the uh, actual display unit that you're going to do. So we go to position and knit. We're going to, well, first we're going to verify the air rack data. I'm using the latest because I have a Navigraph subscription, so we're in 1909. And uh, it's good until September 12th. Today is the 9th, sorry, the 8th of September. So we're still good for a few more days. Um, go to position and knit. And we're just going to confirm our position right there. We're going to put in a reference airport, which is where we're at right now, which is Kilo Papa Hotel X-Ray. You have to get used to this. This is a, a wider CDU display than the Boeings have. So they have an extra norm the Boeings I think end at E so these go to F so all the letters after the first row are kind of off from where you expect to normally see them and it throws me off all the time but you just got used to it so KPHX put that in the reference airport um, you can do the gate if you want nine times out of ten it won't know what you're putting in it so I just leave it blank it doesn't matter these are all just to kind of help basically you're using this as a reference and making sure this is pretty close to this this is a a point on the airport somewhere this is where your actual airplane is fairly close to so these should be close 33 26 point one point three one twelve one eleven zero zero point seven fifty nine point six they're they're within a degree of each other basically so you're you're good uh, the gate would just get this number a lot closer to this if it had it but it usually doesn't so so once you've done that you go to route and at this point, uh, we need to uh, actually look at our route. And actually, uh, something I want to try, I actually haven't done this yet before. Um, I just discovered I could do this with the ACAR system the other day. I didn't realize until I was getting ready to prep this video how detailed the ACAR system actually is available on this aircraft. Uh, so if you go to ACARs down here, uh, link application menu, ANSI standard, here we go. So uh, pre-flight. So we're going to go to pre-flight here. 
init data. Uh, we're going to put our flight number in here, which is 1990. Scheduled date is the 8th. 08. Origin station KPHX. And destination station is KDFW. And the estimated times you can get off of wherever your flight planning software is, I use SimBrief. So our estimated um, time in route is an hour 54. So that goes over here. So 0154. Estimated time of departure, I'm going to look at the clock and just make a judgment. And the last time I did this, I looked at the wrong one. So we're it's just after midnight, um, Zulu time. Let's give it another 20 minutes just to, just to account for whatever. So we'll call it 0020. And then the uh, ATIS flight ID, I think... I think that's WWA for Westland. I think that's what it's looking for there. All right. So we put that in there. We hit return. Uh, we can do our weight and balance over here. We can put our trip fuel and block fuel in here. Our uh, trip fuel is uh, 26.6. Our taxi fuel usually is about 800. Oh, sorry. It was trip fuel. So 20, 26.6 is our block. My bad. Uh, trip fuel is actually just 14,515. There we go. And then we can send that. Return, return. Um, so, but over here we can do reports and requests. So I'm going to go to requests. And first of all, I can do a um, an ATIS request, which is kind of cool. So ATIS, and we're gonna Hello. do. Yeah, they have air. Don't listen sure. to that. K, <laughs> K, uh, PHX is what I want. Where's X? See what I'm talking about? Can't find these things. And we'll say send. So now we go back over here, and there's a light up here that just lit up. Are you car's message? I'm going to turn that off. And we go to received messages. There's the ATIS right there. Phoenix ATIS. And uh, so departure runway 25 right, 25 left, 26. Two um, transition altitude 18,000 feet. It's the U.S. We always know that. Wind is 260 at 12, so absolutely these runways are right. Uh, gusting 26. Uh, 10 mile visibility, a few clouds at 7,500. Scattered at 9,000. Temperature 39, 2.16. QNH. Two niner, six niner. So we've got our, that gave us our uh, altimeter setting right there. So we can set this right now while we're here. Two niner helps to go the correct way. I always start out going the wrong way. Two niner, six niner. Now you need to do that with all three of these. So you do yours, the standby, and the FOs. Six niner. And. Two niner, six niner. You will get a, a, a warning light or a caution light if those are out of sync by a certain amount. So just be aware of that. Um, it also gave us a crew message here. I um, think this is just the preliminary weight information. This is kind of stuff I think it kind of makes up until it like knows for sure what came on. It's like based on what you gave it, it's kind of like estimating things. So I don't really know what... I did this and then I found out it was wrong information, so I just kind of ignored that, but... Um, you can also do, I'm going to see if this works. This is the first time I'm trying this one, by the way. Flight plan. And I copied the Simbri flight plan into this I, in the way I think it works. I don't know if that did it right. Whoops. So we're going to wait for our uh, ACARS message to get received <coughs> after sending that. Uh, the fueling's done and the people are on board, so we can turn that seatbelt sign on now, by the way. We actually could have done that as soon as the uh, fueling was done, but I don't know how long that's going to take. <laughs> I don't think it took that long last time. It just it was a little bit. What's cool about this, though, is if you do this, this will then record your, your time out, your time off, your time on, and your time in. So uh, brakes release, wheels up, wheels down, brakes on at your destination. So if you need that information for a virtual airline or just for your own tracking sakes, uh, it's kind of cool to be able to, to track that. And I just realized there's another page on here. 
Oh, that's the history. That's the last one I did. This was the test flight I did for uh, this video, actually. That's kind of cool. It actually saves the last one. All right, so there was the... Uh, excuse me for a second. <coughs> oh, my gosh. Um, all right, receive messages, flight plan. So let's see if it did this right. No. <laughs> it is still pulling up. So I'm going to figure out how to configure this, because I thought I did this right, but it's still pulling up the old data from something else. So there's a way to do this where you can get the, the ACAR stuff in here, and I, I'll have to read up on how to do that. So I was hoping to show you guys that, but oh well. The ATIS thing was enough to blow me away the other day anyway. So, <clears throat> so needless to say, uh, we go back to menu, we go back to FMC, AFMC, position net we already did, route, here's what we're going to do. So destination is KDFW. I can find the letters. There we go. All right, and then we're going to go departure arrival. So this is where we go back and look at our flight plan. We'll go over all of this uh, in a second, but I'm just going to read it off for right now so we know what it is. It's the Boke 1 departure, and uh, based on where we are on the airport, we're going to be runway 26. And I just uh, put that away. That's all I want to do. So the Boke 1, runway 26. Which is right there. And our transition is Maxo. So there we go. So select select. And we hit route again. And now it'll have our Maxo point there. So now we're going to go direct to TXO. TXO is the next one on our flight plan. We go back to the next page to get to the next spot there. And then uh, direct to uh, Turkey. T U R K I. T U R. KI and then we have the arrival so we go back to departure arrival and the arrival is the victory 2 so I'm going to go down here to down to the bottom victory 2 now we have to pick the kind of angle we're coming in on the victory 2 whether it's going to be the 1 8s 1 7s 1 3s and those are our options so uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to look at the weather real quick I could do this through the ACARS, by the way, um, and I think that only works if you have an external weather, like a like an Active Sky or something. So if it doesn't work for you, it may be because you're not using that. Um, but looking at the expected weather according to my weather brief for DFW, uh, weather estimated to be in two hours is one seven zero at one five gusting two three. So uh, one seven seems to make uh, the most sense. And I'm just going to double check on the DFW side real quick on my charts. And again, I will show you all this in a moment. Uh, but just for my purposes right now, I'm just doing this quick. And so, yeah, the 1.7. So that's the side of the airport we want to be on anyway. So 1.7 center is actually what we'd like to do because I don't want to taxi forever. So I'm not going to do 1.7 left. And I get to choose today because I don't have ATC. So, uh, so we're going to say... Uh, uh, 1 7 on the victory 2, 1 7 center is the ILS we're going to take. And <clears throat> uh, let's see, is our transition waypoint in here? Tricky, there it is. Um, I usually will not set the transition point up here until later, until I confirm that I actually want to do that because it can kind of get funky sometimes with the approach from the star. So I will leave that blank for now. And we'll just go back to route. Um, so we're going to look back through here real quick and make sure I don't have any uh, blank spots. It looks like everything's good. We do have vectors there. That's going to be fun. And then missed approach. So we're good there. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go to the legs page. And then I'm going to come out here. And we're going to switch this to plan mode. And I'm going to pull this back just so I can see. And we're going to step through this and just make sure this makes sense. And nothing's broken. Nothing is disconnected we may have a weird spot when we get to our vectors section but maybe not I think we just got to vector okay yeah, that was the vectors area right there. that's why I did it twice and then the runway and then the missed approach yep okay so we're good so once we confirm that that's all good to go we're gonna switch this back to map mode and we're gonna go down here and we're gonna activate and execute don't forget to do both those activate then execute and then I'm going to look through here one more time and just make sure whoops, make sure I don't have any discontinuities or blanks. We will be aware of this vectors thing right here. We'll deal with that when we get there. 
And it looks good. Okay, so that's good to go. Init ref. All right. So init ref, our zero fuel weight was 117.5. So put that in there. Our fuel today was 20, what did I say, 26.6? I guess I said 26.6, yeah. 26,600, oops, 26.6, slash N. Now, it wants the fuel and the schedule. Your two options are N or A. N is for normal, and A is for alternate or abnormal or whatever you want to call it. The uh, Basically, the story behind this, the MD-80 has a problem with uh, uh, fuel freezing or, or water freezing and condensing in the tanks. And so when operating in really cold areas with like partially filled tanks the or full tanks or something like that, it was basically it would start to burn out of the tanks a little bit first uh, just to keep uh, skin contact down with the fuel because normally it'll burn the center tank out first and then the wing tanks. And the wing tanks will just be sitting there getting colder and colder and colder. So uh, putting the A in there will do that other alternate burn method. The normal will burn it as normal, which is it'll burn the center first and then it'll burn the wings in uh, tandem. So unless you're operating in like up in Moscow somewhere in the, in the Russian winter uh, or in the northeast in the middle of winter or something like that, you're always going to use, uh, use uh, N for normal. And when in doubt, just use N for normal. <laughs> uh, reserves, you'll get that off of your flight plan, but this is basically your alternate and your final reserve amount. Mine is looking like 9.8, so we'll put 9.8. Again, this is all in pounds. Cruise altitude today, according to my flight plan, is 310 or 31,000 feet. You can do 310 or 31,000 feet either way. It still works. And then uh, if you have Active Sky and you put the flight plan into your Active Sky thing that you get off Simbury for wherever, it will give you the average winds aloft and the temperature at top of climb, which you can put in here to refine this even more. You can leave this blank. You'll be fine, but you'll get better accurate numbers and things if you do this. So according to mine, the average winds aloft, 254 at 19. goes there and the temperature of top of climb is minus 32 and so we're going to do minus 32 and you put that in top of climb temperature and it will then calculate the ISO deviation right there transition altitude in the states 18,000 feet if you're in Europe or somewhere else where this is not 18,000 feet you'd want to put whatever the transition altitude is head over to takeoff and we're going to get our V speeds here. You want to make sure fueling is all done before you do this, by the way, or these, because these numbers will change on the fly as the fueling goes in. But our fueling is done, so uh, we have our V1, VR, V2 speeds, assuming this is a dry runway. If it was wet, you'd have to. Uh, there was a way to change it to wet, I thought. Oh, no, wet's right here. So this is dry numbers, these are wet numbers. So uh, runway's dry today, so 139. 142 and 151. And we'll stick that right there. Now that is done, we'll go back to the legs page. And if you click on the uh, speedo here, it will now adjust those bugs automatically to those uh, V speeds for takeoff. When you're already in the air, it will adjust the speed the speed bugs to your landing or stuff. So you don't want to do that until you get close enough to the field because you're your weight will go down as you burn fuel and things like that. So, All right, and then the next things that I do for uh, flying any major airliner is I look at the V1 speed, and it's 151. I put in the speed for v, V2 plus 10, so that's 161. That just gives me a nice little buffer there, so 161. And the rest of this we're going to calculate right now by looking at uh, the map. So before we go on, I'm going to run the... Uh, the pre-flight checklist here real quick. This is provided by um, by Leonardo in their uh, documentation. And so I'm just going to go through this. All this stuff should have been accomplished already. The checklist is not a do list. It's a checklist. You're checking to make sure this already happened. So this is to catch anything you may have missed. So flight recorder, it's not really modeled, so we're not going to worry about it. A AHRS alignment, that is the uh, ver their version of INS, which is actually a GPS system in this. The fact that these things are all showing normal and not wigging out and looking like uh, that <laughs> tells me that they, it is aligned. So that is done. 
Uh, the FMS GPS has been checked and cross-checked. That's the, using these two guys here. Emergency lights are armed. We did that already with the, uh, the PA emergency lights check. The cabin signs are on for uh, seat belts and, uh, and uh, no smoking. Windshield anti-ice is on. Engine sync selector is off. The stall warning was tested. The uh, air conditioning shutoff switch is in auto. That's this guy right there. The fire protection system is tested. And actually, there's one more fire protection test that I did not do that I meant to show you guys. And it's only because I only recently found it, so it's off my radar a little bit. And that is up here. This is the uh, cargo detection suppression systems. And so there's a test button right here. And you can test those and make sure those come on. That detects and fails and swims. Uh, this is where you will get indications, loop A or loop B, if you accidentally leave one of these uh, guys pushed in. Oops. Let me just Fire left engine. example that for you. See that? Loop A is now still, or yeah, yeah, loop A is still on because I didn't actually undo that button. And so, and now it's off, so. That was what I wanted to show you earlier. By the way, up here is the panel and floodlights for the overhead panel. So um, this you should probably turn on. This will turn on the back panel lighting. Again, it's daytime. It's not really a big deal, but it is there. All right. Um, TRP is tested. That was this guy down here. Uh, fuel quantity, we checked that, is uh, 26.55, close enough to our 26.6 .6 with its rounding numbers. Uh, altimeters were checked and set at 29.69, 29.69, and 29.69, all three. Fuel shutoff levers are these guys down here, and they are off. Crab and pressurization lever is in auto, and that's another thing that we would normally test. So you undo the, the auto system, and then you can run this up. See how that moves? This is the uh, outflow valve. And then switch that back to auto, and it should roll back to where it needs to be. So that's how we check that. But that should be up in auto. And that uh, finalizes that checklist. And we're not going to do the before start checklist quite yet because we're going to lock some things down before we do that. So before we do anything else, um, normally I would have called for um, ATC clearance and we would have gotten our clearance. We're going to assume we got that today. I'm going to go ahead and show you our actual uh, flight planning route and then show you the charts that I use to do this because it'll help make some sense of what I'm doing for later things. So I'm going to go ahead. I have a feature on here I can pull up. This is not. This is built into my streaming software. This is not something that comes with the plane. So you're now looking at my uh, other screen basically through, the, the, through that tablet. And uh, this is sim brief. So it's just showing you the relative numbers. The flight level 310, the air time 154 right there. Sorry, I didn't mean to click on things. Uh, block fuel and all that stuff. Here's our route from Phoenix to Dallas and our alternate to Houston. And then our uh, <clears throat> uh, planned fuel, so trip fuel, alternate final reserve, and things like that. And then down here is where you get uh, PAX numbers, cargo numbers, payload, zero fuel weight, fuel, and takeoff weight. So all that stuff is right there. <clears throat> so that's just really nice to see. So we're doing the uh, the broke uh, the broke one uh, departure to Maxo. So we're gonna go over here to uh, Navigraph Charts, and I'm gonna go back to Phoenix, and we're gonna look at. Oh, actually, we're gonna look at the taxi first out of here. This is all part of the departure brief. So uh, this just shows where my plane is. I have it superimposed on here. This again through Navigraph and Simblink, which is awesome. You should get it. Um, we have a super short taxi today because we're at gate Bravo 23. We're going to push back to uh, nose to the right. Uh, we'll come up here, uh, which is basically Bravo 13, Charlie 13, Bravo 13, um, straight ahead. <laughs> and we're right there at the end of runway 26, which is uh, 258 degrees. And then we've got 11,489 feet of runway to deal with. So lots of runway today. And airport elevation here is uh, roughly 1,100 feet. So just something to note. Uh, the SID we're taking today is the Broke 1. Bring that up here. And so we're going to be taking off on 2-6. So that means straight ahead to uh, 1635 at or above. We make our turn to uh, Jutak. Jutak to Wetzel. Wetzel to Rich. Rich to Pipe. And then Pipe to Barl. And then Baroque. And then on to our way over here. We're not going to ABQ. We're going to go to Maxo. 
but we don't have any uh, altitude or speed restrictions except for this guy right there. Um, and obviously 250 knots below 10,000 feet. Something to be aware of, though, is our MSA's minimum safe altitudes. In this quadrant over here, 5,800 feet, and then to the south, 4,800 feet, and then over here, 6,200 feet. This basically means if we stay above 5,800 feet, we will not hit terrain in this area, which is about, uh, I think it's like 25, I think this is about 25 miles from the field in this uh, quadrant here. Um, and same thing over here, 4,800 feet, we have to be at 6,200 feet not to hit any terrain in this vicinity so but really shouldn't be a problem we'll be well above that by the time we get over here this is mainly if we have to stay low because of engine things and we want to be careful about terrain there's terrain over here we're going to avoid as we make our turn and then it's pretty much smooth sailing from there until we get to the mountains all right um real quick we'll actually we'll do the star on uh on the uh, during the flight so we won't do that right now that's all we need to do for right now uh, normally we would talk about transition altitude, but uh, it's 18,000 feet because we're in the United States. It always is. Um, this is a description of the actual thing we just talked about. Top altitude is 8,000 feet. If you were with ATC, uh, this would be important because this means if they told you to climb via the SID, this is as high as you can climb until they give you uh, until they give you higher. So I will set 8,000 in the thing, and we'll just change it up um, on our own when we get close to that because we're not going to have any... Uh, any ATC today. All right, so I'm going to close that. And so we're going to set 258 on the heading because that's the initial runway heading. There we go. And then we're going to set 8000 on the altitude select, and we're going to left click that to pull that out. Now, because the flight direction stuff are off, there's no indication right here, so I may have to do that again, but that's just a good habit to get into with this aircraft. If you don't do that, this means nothing. The aircraft will climb right through that <laughs> if you don't left-click that and pull that out. So just know that big uh, kind of potential problem there. One more thing before we, uh, before we get moving here. Um, actually, two more things, but... Um, you notice this guy right here in front of me looks just kind of weird, whatever. There's another one over here, and I'm looking straight down the barrel of that thing. See that little white dot? That is what you should see. That is how you know you are correctly aligned and your seat is adjusted correctly in this aircraft. So if you're wondering what the correct eye level and position you should be in as far as moving the camera around here, if you look over that thing and you don't see that white clear as day down the barrel, you're in the wrong place. So you want to line yourself up with that. That is the actual guide mark in the real plane, how pilots align their eyes to be able to know they're in the right spot for the uh, for flying the aircraft, which is kind of cool. They actually modeled that uh, in the aircraft. Uh, at this point, once uh, cargo is loaded and the passengers are on board and everyone's clear of the aircraft, uh, we would come over here to the first officer's side and we would turn on the auxiliary hydraulic pump and the trans pump, transfer pump, and you'll see the, the flaps that were kind of drooping now extend back to zero. Hydraulics should go to right around between 28 and 30,000, or sorry, 2,800 and 3,000 psi on both sides. So we're in the we're in the range there. And then I'm also going to turn on the engine pumps to high. We'll turn them to low once we get beyond, um, once we get into our climb. But for now, we'll turn them on the high. They're not going to do anything yet because the engines aren't running, but they'll kick on automatically. And then you can also test your brake temperature right here. This will be important to check before takeoff, and especially if you have a rejected takeoff or you land heavy, uh, you want to make sure these temperatures come down before you pull the gear in, uh, or you could have a wheel well fire. So it's important to know where that is. And then finally, uh, 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 temperature, static air temperature right there is uh, plus 37. It's quite warm today here in Phoenix. And then uh, your true airspeed, which isn't, I mean, it's showing 130, but it's that's not realistic. We're not moving yet, so that'll come alive as it were uh, once we actually get going uh, we do need to do one more thing for our uh, for our takeoff briefing before we can say briefing complete and that is determine whether or not we're going to flex temp or not and there is a whole procedure for this which is actually kind of cool that they actually provide you with the docs to do this because otherwise you're just guessing and so I'm going to pull out the tablet actually one more time here uh, after I open this up not that one there we go all right 
And uh, what we're looking at is uh, this flex temp thing. So operating limitations. So this this is the conditions you have to meet first of all before you can even consider doing flex temp. The runway weight limitation table is available, which we have. I'm going to show you that in a second. The runway is not contaminated by snow, slush, or standing water. It's 37 degrees C outside. No. Uh, De-icing or anti-icing fluid has not been used, so you didn't get de-iced. The ART system is off, which is the um, uh, um, automated reserve thrust system, and I'll show you that in a second. That was that switch we made sure was up and guarded. Uh, the airfoil anti-ice is not used, so you can't be using anti-ice on the aircraft. And all the EPR gauges are operative, exhaust pressure ratio. So um, we meet all those requirements today for right there, so we're within the operating limits. And now we have to determine if we're within the correct limits for what we're going to be doing today. So on this table, this will show you kind of how you read this table. Um, you're going to see the all of these are for flaps 15, so you, this requires a flap 15 takeoff to use these tables, basically. Um, you're going to reference uh, uh, three right here is the uh, the assumed temperature. In brackets is the um, the actual temperature, the actual um, uh, outside air temperature limit. Um, there may be a no takeoff right here, which means you shouldn't be using this at all. Um, the dark uh, bold number up here is your actual um, weight in kilograms. This is important. You will have to convert to use these charts because these charts are always only in the metric system. So if you're using pounds like I am, we're going to convert. So but this is your weight in kilograms. And then this is your um, pitch alt alt attitude in the event of a, um, an engine out, a single engine out, one engine out at attitude. And then this is the wind component. So... Um, if you have a headwind, the headwind component, and if you have a tailwind, minus numbers, tailwind component. All right, so let's go and see. So our, our runway was 11,000 some odd feet. So we're going to scroll down here. So the first table is for a 6,000 foot runway or 1,800 meter runway. Uh, next one, 7,500. Next one, 9,000. 11,000. Hey, look at that. <clears throat> we have our own table. Perfect. Uh, if your runway is somewhere in between you would use the lower one so if you're if we were at a 10,000 foot runway we would be using the 9,000 foot runway thing because you can't use 11,000 feet and you you're missing a, a thousand feet of runway obviously that wouldn't work so so 11,000 feet it's actually more than 11,000 feet this runway so we're, we're safe to use the 11,000 foot runway um, so first of all we need to uh, know a few things we need to know our headwind component and we need to know our weight in kilograms so we're going to look one more time at the uh, ATIS down here. Um, let me get that. Menu. A cars. Uh, received messages. ATIS. So the wind was 260. That's right down the runway at 12 knots, gusting 26. So typically the way you would do this is you would take all of the, the wind plus half the gust or so. And so we would say we've got a 12 knot headwind plus roughly another 12 knots of, of gust. So that's about 24 knots or so. Um, the table only goes to 10, so we'll just use the 10 number. So anything beyond that is just is just icing on the cake, <laughs> as it were. So uh, thankfully it's right down the runway. If this was, say, uh, 45 degrees off, then you take a percentage. It's like 35% of the, the winds come off or something like that to... It's, there's a whole formula for it, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but um, it's no longer a 90-degree crosswind is zero winds as far as you're concerned, and so it's, just, it's within that gamut. So anyway, all right, back to the tablet. Um, so we're going to be in, the, in this category over here, and then we need to know what our uh, gross weight is, which is 144,000 pounds roughly. And so I'm going to pull out my calculator here that has a, a, a weight conversion on it. And we're going to convert that, change to weight and mass, change this to pounds. If I can find it, there we go. And we're going to say 144,000. And we're going to look at that in kilograms is 65,317 kilograms, so 65.3. So we're going to find our weight on this because we're in dry. So 65.3 is, uh, we'll use the, the bigger number basically here. So it's uh, 65.3. Um, the assumed temperature we would be able to use is 35, but 
the outside limit is not applicable, which means we cannot use flex because mainly we're we're too we're too heavy. So if we were if we were just a little in fact we were if we were just a little bit under, we would be able to use uh, flex temp if the temperature was 30 degrees or less outside, but it's not even. It is 37, so um, we still couldn't use it. So it's too hot even to to use flex. So so we will not use flex today. But I will show you what we would do if we did use flex. So if we did, let's just say for the sake of argument, the 35 we could use, and we were going to do a 35 flex temperature. So let me show you what we would do for that. So we would go over here. Actually, I'm going to go back to that because I can get closer. We would go over here and we would dial up this assume temperature to the flex temperature. You would see it uh, show up in one of these screens over here with the flight director on. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to screw up my aircraft. <laughs> uh, and then you would click uh, take off flex instead of take off. So take off flex. And then you would turn the art off because this has to be off. That's one of the prerequisites of using flex temp. So we're going to turn that back on because we're not going to use flex temp. We're going to use take off. So... Uh, we don't have to do that. But that's the last part of the takeoff brief for this aircraft that we need to do. So now we're going to uh, make sure all the doors are closed. I think they would have done that for us. We have another air cars message. Why do we have another air cars message? Oh, that was a flight plan one. That's right. So I could kill that. Uh, we're going to right click over here and look at doors and stairways. You notice it says uh, PA is not set correctly. That's because we turned it back to VHF1 over there. We're not talking to them. But you notice they closed all the doors. Green means they're closed. Red means they're open. So everything's closed, so we're good. So at this point, um, we're going to start the APU. So do that. Start pump on. I'm actually going to turn our um, just our left fuel pumps on for the APU. Master to run. And then start. And we're going to hold start until we see that EGT start to rise there. And there it goes. So we'll let go, and I can just hit and run, and then this should spool up. Uh, gave us another A car message. I'm guessing that might be an updated. Oh, that's the load sheet. So this is the final load sheet. This is what you would actually use. So there's our 17.5. This has all the correct numbers now. Dry operating weight, yeah. And so we can just acknowledge that that we received that. Our PAX numbers. So it's just kind of cool that you actually get that information eventually. Um, I don't back the jetway off until this is started because uh, sometimes the jetway is considered the ground power and then it will reset everything and kill you. So, so we're going to switch over to APU and you have that audible to tell you that it's there and then you're going to turn off the bus and with that off we can now come over here and tell the mechanic to disconnect yes, everything. Sir. You're cleared to disconnect. And while he's doing that, I'm going to move the jetway. Undock, confirm. And that should start to move away. There it goes. <clears throat> and we're about to push now, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on the beacon, which is right here next to the nav lights. And after the APU's been on for a little while, you can turn on the APU air, and we get pneumatic pressure right there. And so I'm going to go ahead until we actually get everything connected and we're ready to start. I'm going to go ahead and put this on to air conditioning colder just to give us some more uh, stuff. And we're going to turn the air conditioning systems on to auto. That's two clicks down on each one. And those will spool up right there. Uh, the last thing I want to do, and I forgot to do this during our uh, uh, takeoff brief, but I wanted to uh, get the alt um, Alt, uh, elevation of the uh, destination field. So I'm going to get that real quick uh, over here in sim brief so we can set our pressurization right. You could do that in flight, I mean, but I'd rather do it on the ground because I won't think about it in flight. So elevation is roughly 560 feet, depending on where you are on the field. 560, 600. We'll call it 560. So we're going to, whoops, we're going to go up here. And we're going to move the landing altitude up. These are in hundreds of feet, so that's 300 feet, 400 feet, 500, 50, 60. That's good enough right there. And then as of right now, 
the uh, or at least the uh, assumed uh, barrow is two nine eight six. So I set a initial barrow. So two nine uh, eight six. That's going to be roughly there. And then as we get closer and we get the actual ATIS from uh, DFW, we'll we'll reconfigure that and set that. All right. And then we're going to call for push and start. Now, they just changed this, and so I kind of want to check and see, but I don't. Quick edit pushback, nose to the right, tail left. Uh, that's what I want to do anyway, so I'm just going to do that. They, they kind of made it like better pushback now, which is kind of awesome. And I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, and I don't want to do it for the tutorial. So he's going to come. While he is doing, while he is getting over here, we're going to run the before start checklist. And just make sure everything is ready to go. I don't remember if this is... Oh, they are. Yeah, be quiet. Okay. They were. Oh, Captain. Can't tell. So, parking brakes are set. Pneumatic pressure is um, is correct for... It's not correct for starting because we're running the air, but it was when we did do it, so we're fine. Um, engine ignition selector is going to go to A or B. So, I just alternate based on when we do it last. So, we'll just do A for today. Uh, left, right, center fuel tank pumps would all come on at this point. Uh, Anti-collision light is on. That's the beacon. Uh, APU norm econ switch is in norm. That's this guy right here. Check completed. There. Bypass bin inserted. Air conditioning supply Release off. Brakes. So brakes released. Push. All engines clear. Start at will. All right. So he's closed for engine start. So we're going to go ahead and turn off the air conditioning pumps now. And that brings our new mag pressure back. So air conditioning supply switches are off. Pneumatic cross feed levers are open. That was these guys that I turned on earlier. And thrust levers are idle. So we are good for engine start. So to start the engine, there's another, you got to do some amount of mouse gymnastics. So we're going to open the guard on number two. And we're going to hold down with the left mouse button, holding the mouse button down the entire time while we scroll down here. I'm still holding the left mouse button. We're going to wait till the uh, um, N2 reads about 20. And then I'm going to right click on that just to make sure it doesn't unclick this. <laughs> and then I left clicked on the uh, on the uh, thing. That took a little while to figure out how to do that without one turning off. And so, yeah. Once that switches over, the generator switches over, you can then close the guard to turn off the starter and let that just kind of stabilize for a moment. And once that is stable, then we can go ahead and do the same thing with number one. So again, once we get to 20, I'm going to right click and then left click. So right click and then left, let go of the left click mouse to click. And just kind of do it all in a quick sequence. And it should uh, hold OK. There we go. Just watching to make sure everything fires up okay. We're going to get a transfer over here in a second. There it goes. And we can close that. All right. Now that all the engines are started, you can turn off. We turn off the uh, engine start switch. Uh, we'd also lock the. Uh, whoops, that's the. Sorry, that was <laughs> windshield. Lock the door, <laughs> the cockpit door right there. We will turn back on the air conditioning system. And we will now turn off the APU. So I'm going to actually turn it off just to make sure nothing happens. We'll turn off the APU air. And we'll turn off the APU and the start pump. Set parking brakes. Parking brakes set. We're now going to turn on the flight directors. We're going to set the flaps to. 15, which is right there. So it's the first one is the slats, the second one is I think 11, and then 15. You can see the indication right there coming into 15. We're going to right click the uh, the uh, auto spoiler, the spoiler right there, just put it in automatic mode. Uh, close, close the pneumatic cross feeds, auto brake to take off, and arm the auto, auto brake. This does nothing if that's off. And then we're also on the ramp here, so we would set that to squawk mode. I turn, I leave TARA off until I get to the runway, just as a, as a uh, thing I like to do. All right, so that is all set across the board. 
We can go ahead and look at the after start checklist to make sure we didn't miss anything. Engine ignition selector is off. Uh, the pedo static heaters, we now Mind need to turn on to captain. The airfoil and engine anti ice systems are not required today, so we're going to leave them off. Air conditioning supply switches are back to auto. The door cue light is checked and off. That's this guy right here. And the hydraulic system is checked and set. So we turned on the uh, the pumps, all the pumps earlier. You leave the ox and the hydraulic and the transfer pumps on until we're airborne uh, through the takeoff. We're then going to select takeoff mode for the for the Epers right there. And the only uh, caution and warning is the parking brake selector. So, looks like we're ready to go there. That's after start. And we got to do for the taxiing. The APU air switch has been turned off. The uh, trip art as required. It is on because we're going to be using it. The V-bugs are set. The flight instruments are checked. That's the altimeters and your headings and all that stuff. Uh, FMS GPS system is checked. That's all done. Uh, flight controls. We want to check our flight controls real quick. So we're going to push that forward and back. And this is a goofy thing with my flight controls themselves. They're kind of being dumb. So i got to kind of hit them a little bit. And then now they go all the way. And I'm just make sure I run them all the way through their full range of movement. And then we're going to do the same thing with the rudders down there. Make sure the rudder pedals go. Again, if you don't have um, actual controls, this isn't as much of a thing, but it is for me. Uh, flight controls are tested. Flap slat lever is extended to uh, 15, and we have 15 on the gauge. Auto brake auto spoiler is armed. Uh, aileron, rudder, and stabilizer trims are 0, 0, and set. And takeoff briefing was complete. Cabin report was received, and taxi checklist is now complete. So we are ready to taxi. We're going to release the brake. That should turn the uh, caution light off, and then we can just reset that guy right there. So we turn the taxi light on to taxi, novel though it may be, and give it a little gas. And she starts to move. Now at this point, um, because I prefer to do it. <laughs> I'm going to click down here and turn this guy off because he just kind of gets in the way of this. And since I've got my own yoke, I don't, I've got autopilot disconnect switches on my yoke physically, so I don't need those. Um, so I just get that guy out of the way so I don't have to worry about it being in my way. Uh, do that if you wish, but I, I just don't like it in my way. I am going to turn up these guys. These are the, the lighting for the, uh, Auto flight panel here. We're going to go over to Bravo 13. Oh, you're not going to have time to do that. We're going to take off super fast here. Alright, so here is the uh, entrance onto the runway. Actually, well, yeah, we're going to go here. I don't care. Screw it. I'm going to wait right here for a second, give her a chance to finish anyway, but also I need to turn on this to TARA, that's the traffic. This allows us to check here real quick, make sure we don't have anything. I'm not on the network, so I know there is no traffic, but we could, you'd want to check. You'd also get clearance from the tower at this point if, they're, uh, if you were going to be relying on them. And we'll do our before takeoff checklist this time. So takeoff data is confirmed, that's our V speeds. And we got 161 right there. Uh, fuel balance. Just going to look down here and make sure these are all balanced and we're just burning out of the center tank. Brake temperatures are well in the range we need them to be. Engine ignition selector now goes to both, which is right there. And the EAOP is checked, which is your uh, basically your takeoff warning stuff. So we're going to kind of that'll run in a moment when we do this. But I don't think there's another way to do it aside from just running that up and seeing that nothing happens and nothing does, So, which means we're good. So, we're going to brakes release again, and we're going to move into the uh, runway zone. We need to bring the uh, landing lights into, uh, into what, what do they call that, extended. <laughs> and then we're just going to prepare to follow our, uh, our departure out of here.
Remember, this plane is long, so you want to put the nose kind of over the center line first, at least, to, to bring that around to, to line this up correctly. And once we're there, if we have takeoff clearance, we'll send that to bright. We'll send the landing lights to on. This needs to be into strobe. And that's all it is. Now, auto throttle on. Right here are the toga switches. So I'm going to, I have a button to hit them on my yoke, so I'm not going to touch them there. But if uh, you don't, you would run this up to about, uh, Uh, what is it, around 50% in one or so, and then hit toga. Now you could also leave the um, the, the auto throttle switch off and hit toga, and these would go to take off. And then when it's time, you just hit the auto throttle switch on if that's easier for you. Either way works. I prefer to do it with the toga buttons because that's the better way to do it since I have it set. kind of see now why I didn't want us to flex temp. <laughs> Look how long that took even with the uh, normal. So you rotate nice and smoothly. Gear up. Do not follow the flight director for your rotation. That's not what it's designed to do. Rotate naturally and then slowly come up to meet the, alt the, uh, the flight director. Alright, it was above 1600 something feet before we make the turn so we can now make the turn. And we'll, this is where I kind of ignore the flight director for a little bit because it always has me pitch up too far to hold that. And once we're past 1,000 feet, I want to gain a little bit of altitude. And then I'll pull the, uh, I'll pull the initial set of flaps in. So uh, basically we're going to get past that speed bug before we pull the flaps in. So, And there it is. So we're going to go ahead and pull in one notch of flaps to 11. And we can also come over here and hit VNAV and that will tell the uh, system to uh, climb and accelerate correctly. It's also going to move us down to climb thrust, which means we need to select CL there for the EPR limit. And it's still wanting us to climb faster than I want to because I'm trying to accelerate. So I'm not sure where it gets... Like, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. And so a lot of times I find I just end up ignoring the flight director on the vertical for the first bit and then go back to it later. We can also set nav to uh, make the flight director follow the uh, that course there. In fact, that may be part of it. It may be looking for that nav data as well as the... Once we get past... Uh, actually, past 180, I can go ahead and set the slats. Slats up is that 200 bug right there. So we're going to wait. Now, you could engage the autopilot at this point. I, I prefer to hand fly these things as long as possible, mainly because it's more fun. And there's the 200 bugs, so we're going to go slats up. Slats These are those mountains we had to be aware of on the uh, departure uh, plan. So we're going to be turning here in a moment. Flight director will command it. There it goes. And we'll just follow the flight director. You keep that limbed up. Watch your slip indicator right here with your rudders. Keep that uh, ball centered. The, uh, for those of you that have uh, ever done private pilot uh, uh, flying or lessons, uh, you probably have heard the phrase, step on the ball. Basically, if that ball swings to the left, you push on the left rudder pedal to bring that ball back into swing, and opposite if it swings to the right. So that's uh, how, you keep the, uh, how you keep the aircraft. Uh, uh, there's a word for it now, it's escaping me. <laughs>
you want to be very careful with the engines in this aircraft. If you exceed um, the um, EGT limits, you will flame out your engines. So uh, uh, adhering to the EPR limits that it gives you is of critical importance. You definitely don't want to ignore those. All right, coming up on 8,000, so we're going to go ahead and roll this up to our cruising altitude of 3-1. And I'm going to pull it, and I see 3-1 there, so I know it's uh, it's going to capture that. If you don't see your altitude right here, you're trying to capture right there, then it will not capture the altitude. It'll just keep going through it when it gets to that point, so be aware of that. And it's not registering on the ND, so i got to redo this VNAV. There it goes. Sometimes you gotta like give it a kick in the butt to confirm where you're trying to go with this thing. It can be a little finicky sometimes. All right, that's 10,000 feet, so we're going to pick the uh, landing lights and taxi lights off. And we'd also check our pressurization right now. We call them 10 checks. Make sure that is uh, pressurizing the aircraft appropriately, because beyond 10,000 feet, that's where you can start to have problems. We'll continue to roll this around over here. And then I'm going to put the autopilot on. We'll do our uh, other, other checks. Back to get this back on our round here. There's uh, the airport down there we just came from, Phoenix Sky Harbor. So that's me doing the trim, so it's yelling at me. That's just again, it's just telling me that it's moving. So I'm gonna go over here and switch autopilot on. And you have nav track, VNAV climb. There's the capture and uh, FMS commanded EPR. So that's telling the engine it's basically gonna climb as fast as it can given that pressure setting, that EPR setting. So after the uh, 10,000 feet, though, we do want to turn. Take that back to off. You want to verify the auto brakes are off and off right there. Uh, we already turned that on. That's good to go. Uh, up here on the top, if uh, the weather is appropriate, you can turn the seatbelt sign off. Sometimes you might wait a little longer. We can turn the uh, ignition system back to off. And I'm trying to think about missing anything on there. That's why we do the checklist here. So. Looking at the uh, after takeoff checklist, brake temperatures. Uh, we didn't have any real braking action, so we didn't really have to worry about that. But uh, landing gear is uh, up, lights out. Auto brake is off. Speed brake lever is uh, retracted there. Flat and slap levers are up and retracted. Engine ignition selector is off. Center fuel tank pump, uh, we're going to leave it on for right now. Uh, eventually, it will burn down first, and we'll have to turn that off. We'll get a warning in flight to do that. And altimeters will reset to standard when we get past 18,000 feet. And that is basically everything for the takeoff of the uh, of the Mad Dog. Uh, after this, it's all just basically uh, climbing up to cruise, and uh, you can let the autopilot do that for you. The other thing uh, I, I should have done, actually, I didn't think about doing. Uh, normally, you would hit the uh, chrono when you uh, get clearance for takeoff when you start to roll, uh, just to give you an accurate clock. Uh, but if we come down here to the uh, A cars. Uh, system. We can go down here to 
flight log. And she tells us our time out was 43, and our time off was 47. And so it'll tell us when our wheels touch down and when we put our parking brake on in Dallas. Which is pretty cool, I think. All right, so we got these uh, big white fluffy clouds here. We want to make sure that they're not an issue for us. So the other thing we would also have done is we would have turned on our weather. <laughs> and so you hit that power button right there. I'm also going to... Now, this is the thing I want to show you. So you can move the uh, range rings with, the, uh, with this knob here. Or you can use your middle mouse wheel and do that. And see that range ring moving to 20. And I usually set it about 40. And there we're getting some weather right there off in the distance. So not the cloud we're up against, but beyond it. Because this is like 20 miles out. But there is some weather there. Now we may climb up beyond it by the time we get over there. But yeah, we're looking at stuff like this over there. Where we actually do have some weather. Now green green is generally okay. Yellow is going to be kind of bumpy. Uh, red is what you want to avoid. Because uh, that's where the really bad turbulence is. And... So, you want to skirt around that weather. Uh, we're up past 18,000 feet, so we're going to uh, change our barrow here to uh, 2992, which is standard. In Europe, it would be uh, 1013 millibars. But we use inches of mercury in the state, so we're going to do that. This one can be kind of hard to see so because it's tiny, so if your resolution isn't that great, you can always zoom into it. And you can always just verify that it's about the same as your other one there. And then we got to do the same thing with the FOs. And move that back to 2992 as well. Also, just something to know. This is something I didn't realize uh, until later on. Um, so just some good aviation knowledge. So altitude and flight level are technically two different things. Um, an altitude is your actual altitude above mean sea level, and we call it MSL. Um, that's what you're out. That's that's right now. According to my altimeter, I'm at 20,680 feet, 740 feet, you know, so on and so forth. But that is reference to the actual atmospheric barometric pressure of where I am. So uh, if I'm under 18,000 feet. I will have the local barrow set so that that altitude is accurate within reason. So other airplanes are also registering that and seeing that they're at my same altitude. Once we get above what we call transition level, um, we switch to using flight levels, which are all referenced to 2992 or 1013 on the standard barrow pressure. Meaning, on any given day, Flight level 180 may not be at 18,000 feet above sea level. It may be at 17,600 feet. And the next day, given the pressure, it may be at uh, 18,500 feet. But it's always flight level 180, and as long as everyone has their standards set right, they'll all be at that flight level. So it's only referred to as a flight level when you're in, when you're beyond that transition altitude and you're using standard pressure. So. If someone says, I'm at flight level 120, unless you're in Europe, <laughs> no, you're not. You're at 12,000 feet. Uh, when you go outside the U.S., depending on the different country, their transition level is, can be much different. In England, it can be low, as low as like 3,000 feet. Uh, and so everything above that is a flight level. 
So you also don't say I'm at 28,000 feet when you're talking to air traffic control. You would say you're at flight level 280. So just something to know. But you always want to check on your chart. It will tell you uh, what the uh, transition level is. The United States and I think Canada and Mexico for the most part are all 18,000 feet. I'm not 100% on Mexico, but I'm pretty sure Canada is as well. Uh, once you get over to Europe, they change by country. It's not just Europe as a whole. It's A lot of them are the same, but most of them it's different by country. And uh, if you're ever curious where to find that, if you look at your... Um, uh, let me pull up Phoenix's chart here. Uh, usually the best place to look is on the SID or the... Uh, uh, or sometimes a star, or at least the approach plate. One of those three will tell you. But that's not always. I found it's not always listed on the SID, which is annoying. So let me pull up the uh, tablet here. So right here on the this is the star for the boats that we took, and here we are, by the way, um, right up here. It says transition altitude 18,000 feet. So below that, you're using the st the altimeter for the locality. Beyond that, you're using standard standard altimeter pressure. If we were to look at the uh, star for Phoenix, just one of them, let's just look at the, the Hydra 1. I don't know if it'll tell you on here, because I've noticed a lot of times the star doesn't have it, it's on the approach. Even though the star will take you below transition altitude, which I find odd, but yeah, I don't see it on here. But if you look at one of the approaches, let's say for uh, runway 26, which is where we just uh, took off from, right here you'll see set Altitude set inches, transition level, file level 180, transition altitude 18,000 feet. So you see the difference? Transition level is 18,000, is one, flight level 180, transition altitude is 18,000 feet. There, there is a distinction. And depending on the country, sometimes these numbers will be a little different too. So it's like you'll, you'll change at a different altitude than you would think. So it's not always as succinct as that. So you just got to look at when you actually transition, depending on if you're going up or down. So, just stuff to know. It's good to know. All right, so we're continuing our climb up here. We're at uh, 25,000 feet. We've got the top of climb on the rate on the uh, on the ND there. Uh, the other thing that's the other thing we're supposed to do at uh, 10,000 feet, or during the climb at some point is we turn off the uh, the aux and the trans. So then we just go to this, and we put these in low. So these will go down to about 15, so 1,500 pounds. That's not on the checklist, but that's something you're supposed to do. Something I really wish they had modeled, which as far as I can tell they have not yet, is the uh, standby magnetic compass. Uh, up here is these little mirrors, which actually do like reflect something, but um, they should be reflecting back an image from right here, which is where the standby compass actually lives in the actual aircraft. And uh, it's reversed, so you can read it correctly through these mirrors and actually see the the compass heading, which actually you can't, it just is a mirror that pops up for nothing. But in the actual aircraft, that's how you read the actual magnetic compass to verify your uh, your uh, indicator down here, which is pretty awesome, actually. So if you are using uh, ATC, then you'd be programming your uh, voice comms right here. Um, this is VH nav, VHF nav 2. I'm oh, sorry, VHF 2, not VHF nav. Uh, VHF 1, VHF 2, your uh, um, uh, ADF and uh, cell call, which really isn't going to do anything. And then this is, uh, I think, has to do with your uh, comm for your ACAR system, which, again, isn't really going to do anything. You can just leave that alone. Your uh, nav radios are up here, so this is uh, VHF nav 1 and nav 2. And this is where you would program in your uh, VORs uh, or also your uh, ILS frequencies when the time comes. 
I don't uh, I don't recall if it'll it'll pop in the ILS frequency appropriate here, but it will not set it for you. You have to you have to put it in yourself. The ILS in the course. So while we're while we're doing our climb here, let me just take you on the cockpit to some other switches and buttons we didn't necessarily interact with, but um, you will need to know what they are in the event of flying this aircraft. So when it comes to the autopilot settings, obviously you have your two flight directors. Um, and then you have um, your FMS override. So if you need to override the speed temporarily, this is like a speed intervene on a Boeing. Uh, so, you you know, you want to not, you don't want to exit VNAV mode, but um, air traffic control says, uh, hey, maintain 250 knots for the, you know, until such and such. You would hit FMS override, then you would set your new speed right here. You could also do the same thing with the mock selector. Um, if you're going to do it yourself and not use VNAV, then uh, speed or mock select mode, and you, you type it in here, you can push this to uh, change between mock and, uh, and speed select. And then uh, EPR limit, which will just track, it will basically push the engines up to whatever limit you have selected here, which is why it's important to have the correct ones set here. Uh, your auto throttle master switch is right there. Nav mode is is L nav as far as the uh, if you're used to Boeing, that's the equivalent of L nav. VOR loc is if you want to do actual VOR navigation or you want to capture the localizer of the uh, ILS system. Uh, ILS will do what VOR loc does, but will add on the glide slope. And auto land will do uh, what it says. It'll it'll land. It'll it'll flare. It'll it'll do everything. So uh, this does have full auto land. Uh, your heading selector, and uh, to use the heading select, you pull this knob right here, and I think right-clicking will actually just hold whatever your current heading is. So you've got two. You can push it or pull it. Uh, I believe pulling it selects the heading you select here. Pushing it, which is the right-click, I believe, uh, will just, whatever your current heading is, it'll just hold that current heading. And then you have the automatic, uh, the bank angle limiter right here. In fact, up here, we would, uh, now that we're up, to uh, altitude for the most part we would set this to about uh, 15 or so actually I guess that's 20 so that would be 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 yeah so 15 is right there just to make for a smoother bank in the in the air uh, your vertical speed which it's it's managing this it'll, this can be confusing because it'll show vertical speed um, and use vertical speed indicator it's the autopilot doing it but it's using VNAV, so just know you'll see that move around all the time. The autopilot's doing it. Don't be confused by that. Uh, so you can you can use vertical speed though as your own deal. Um, IAS or mock hold, which is um, basically it'll it'll climb uh, to your selected altitude using the EPR limit. Essentially, is what that's doing in conjunction. VNAV using the the vertical guidance, and then alt hold is like right clicking on the the uh, heading it'll just hold whatever your current altitude is uh, autopilot you've got uh, system one and two if you're the captain flying you keep it in system one and then altitude again make sure you pull that out to uh, actually select your uh, altitude there and then uh, this uh, turbulence button uh, is actually a, an interesting video on a um, on the, an actual MD-80 talking about how nobody uses this function and it has something to do with the oscillations of the uh, of the uh, aircraft to hold your altitude or something like that. It allows these kind of wide... Anyway, it's just a weird function that's available that nobody uses, so don't worry about that. You don't push that when you hit turbulence. Let's just put it that way. Um, you have floodlights here for around the aircraft, so if you're on the ground you and it's dark, you want to light up the outside of the aircraft as well as the wing lights. Uh, you can do that. Your anti-collision and your strobes, we already talked about those. Um, these guys down here, this is the other thing that's important to know, that's kind of, so you have takeoff mode, takeoff flex, if you're using flex, uh, this is go around, so we'll select that when we're on the approach, so that way we have the maximum go around, takeoff, this is kind of like the same as toga, but it's your go around thrust. Uh, MCT is maximum continuous thrust, so you would use that if you needed the maximum thrust where you could leave the thrust levels there for an extended period of time. Takeoff is the maximum thrust for like two minutes. And then you need to go to climb power, and so just know that. And then once we're done with climb, we'll go to we'll set for cruise power, which is uh, our cruise power thrust right there. Um, the other thing that's interesting in this aircraft, there's two indications of um, of uh, temperature. 
So you have down here, this is the static air temperature. It's minus 32 degrees C outside the aircraft right now at this altitude. Uh, we are currently at 30,000 feet. We're... Wait a minute. We said 31, right? Oh, there it goes. That's right. It's 50. I always, I'm, I'm used to the Boeings where it does it after 100. And I'm just going, why isn't it saying we're coming up on our altitude right there? Um, over here you have uh, the RAT, which is the ram air temperature. So this is always going to be less. This is kind of like taking into account the fact that the air is hitting the aircraft at 452 knots or whatever it is at this point. Um, well, actually, it's not that. It's, it's less than that. But um, And that creates friction and, and creates heat. So the effective skin temperature of the aircraft isn't going to necessarily be uh, minus 34. It's going to be minus 7 in this case. And this is important to know with regard, we want to watch our fuel temperature. Remember I told you this aircraft has a problem with uh, water condensing in the fuel tanks and then freezing. And so when this fuel temperature gets down to uh, around 0 degrees C and below, uh, we would want to pop the fuel heaters on. And the lower this temperature gets, the lower these temperatures will start to get. And uh, so we just want to be aware of that. We're now hitting our cruise altitude, so we're going to switch that over to cruise mode right there. And that changes the, the EPR gate. It doesn't mean it'll hold that speed, it just means the engines won't be commanded above that speed. Uh, you can look at your gross weight or zero fuel weight by clicking this here. So there's our zero fuel. If you hold that down, it'll show that. Let go, and it'll go back to gross weight. Your total fuel and then the fuel in each tank. It's kind of a cool little system there. And then we talked about the brake indicator. Uh, these are all standard. You're used to those, or at least you should be if you're flying any kind of airplanes. Um, over here we've got um, your rudder hydraulic um, uh, power. You can switch it from a high, uh, powered to manual if you have problems with hydraulics. Um, or, or um, yeah, <laughs> with the hydraulics basically. And then over here is the uh, fuel cross feed. So if you need to cross feed the fuel, uh, you can open that up. Don't run with that normally because you'll get a fuel imbalance if you're not intentionally doing something. But just know that you can do that. And then obviously the electronic trim. You can also use the suitcase handles to, to pull the trim back as well. Um, stabilizer trim cutout. This is... Uh, this is what we'll uh, call the MCAS switch in this plane. If you start to get trim runaway, electronic trim runaway, open this and flip it closed. Uh, that'll cut out the electronic stabilizer trim. You'll have to do it with the suitcase handles manually, but at least then you'll have control. This plane is not equipped with MCAS. I want to <laughs> qualify that, but that was the issue with the MCAS system is that the trim was running away, basically. And that's what the pilots were supposed to do is just disconnect the electronic trim. If the trim doesn't do something you're supposed to do, that's a memory item. You kill those things. It's not part of any checklist. You're supposed to know it because you got to do it fast. Uh, let's see. What else is over here that's uh, helpful? Uh, you've got your uh, speed limits for uh, slats and flaps and gear. So gear down should not be extended beyond 300 knots. Slats, uh, mid slats, 280, or full slats, 240. Uh, flap 11 at 280. Flap 15, 240. And uh, 20 to 40, 195. Uh, terrain uh, override and terrain switch. So I can turn terrain on right there, which is kind of cool. And terrain override if uh, if it's yelling at me too much and I don't want it to. Uh, this is interesting. We got a big red cell. We may have to uh, do a little bit of diversion around that. That's uh, probably about 80, no, probably about 70 miles out. Can we see that? That's just in there somewhere. So actually, I'm going to extend the radar a little bit to see if I get a fuller picture of what that looks like. Yeah, so it looks like it'd be safer to go up here to the... Yeah, the whole cell is over this way, so it'd be safer to go up around this way. So we're actually going to do that. So um, this is actually good because uh, we would divert around this. We'd get air traffic control permission if we were going to do this, by the way. But we'll take our heading indicator, which is over there. The other thing you're supposed to do is you're supposed to follow your uh, navigation with the heading indicator. So it's a little easier to do when you have a co-pilot again. But 
And I think an update to the Mad Dog is making this a little more user-friendly with regards to speed of turning this thing. <laughs> this takes a while. So we're going to move this to beyond this range over here. And we're going to pull. And so that changes to heading select, and now the plane is going to go off of this other route and track over here slightly. And we're going to try to avoid the, uh, the heart of the storm. Uh, let's see. Anything else that I need to show you guys while we're uh, up here on the cruise? Um, these uh, circuit breakers, actually a lot of them are clickable and usable. <laughs> So if you ever have a problem with the system, check up here. If you see white, a white ring, that means the breaker is popped. So you don't want to see white. So if you see white, try pushing that in. It might solve your problem. You might have a pop breaker. Uh, I honestly don't remember what that is, but I think it has to do with the flight recorder. Oh, it is. Flight recorder normal and ground test, too. So that's the service panel right there for the uh, ground crew. We pretty much went through everything on the uh, the overhead, so I don't think there's anything left to uh, talk about there. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all uh, all taken care of. Oh, the other thing we should talk about is dial a flat. Um, I'm just gonna take a look at the weather radar return. Yeah, okay. Um, so this uh, aircraft, like a lot of McDonnell Douglases, have a dial a flap, and for takeoff you usually keep it in stow position. This is normally used mostly for landing, uh, but you can, if you want something other than the special, the specific detents of 11 and 15, you can dial in your own flap setting here within a certain range, and when your flap handle goes into that section, then it will it'll select that degree of flap. So. Um, I haven't come across a situation where I needed to use it on this aircraft. I usually just leave it stowed, uh, but it's an always it's an option in case uh, in case you need to use it. I mean, you just basically move this uh, this thing right here, and uh, you, you watch it in the window. So we just leave it at the stow position uh, for takeoff normally. Uh, right. Looks like we're uh, going to snake around the weather here nicely. And then I'll show you how to reacquire the route, because there's a, a trick to do it in the uh, in the MD, which I always thought was a pain, but then I figured out how to do it, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. It's just not like Boeing, so I'm not used to it. So we were tracking to Jesua. Which is right here, so we're not going to be tracking to Jesua, and we're probably not going to track to that. We're probably going to go beyond it, because that these are both kind of in the storm cell. So once we get beyond this enough, then we will uh, we'll start turning back to the right to angle around the storm. And, uh, and then we'll have to do this. So basically what we're going to do, in a Boeing, all you would do is you'd say, okay, our next, we're going to skip Jesua and Maxo. Um, so our next waypoint is Texo, so we would select Texo. We put it up here, and it would you'd ex activate execute, and it would just take our present position and draw a new course line straight to the uh, new waypoint. And your aircraft, you hit you hit L nav, and the aircraft would turn there, and you'd be good. In the Bowen, in the McDonnell Douglas, though, if you do that, do it that way, it will go. Okay, you want to go straight to Gesso? It'll just take these points out, but it'll leave this course here. And it will then try to bring your plane all the way back to line up with the original course and come on the original course, which is a waste of time uh, and, and especially dangerous if it's going to pull you back into a storm cell. So what you have to do is you have to do this direct intercept, and you basically take the, um, the waypoint that you're wanting to do, put it down here, and it will do that for you. So that's basically the, the different procedure that you need to use. So I'm going to start to kind of angle back toward this thing. Because I don't want to lose a whole lot of ground just because we're going around a, a cell. Okay. 
by the way, if you're not used to looking at these, the, the cabin pressure is this dial here. Um, the outer ring is the cabin altitude. The inner ring is the pressure differential between the outside and the inside. So our uh, pressure differential right now is, uh, looks like 7.8 maybe, 7.7. .7. And our cabin altitude is currently 5,800 feet, something like that. So the cabin is pressurized to 5,800 feet, almost 6,000 feet. And the outside air pressure obviously is pressurized for 31,000 feet, which is not very breathable for most people. <laughs> and so the difference in pressure between outside is uh, about 7, 7.7, 7.8 pounds per square inch, which means if a cabin door blew open right now, that would equalize to zero, and the, in the course of doing it, all that pressure would be exiting the plane. So you basically want to make sure when you're climbing out past 10,000 that your your cabin pressure is increasing. Your differential isn't outside the, the boundaries of what is capable for the plane. And you should see cabin climb to some extent telling you the cabin is climbing. Uh, when we descend, we should see the cabin is descending eventually on schedule. So that's uh, what you want to look for on those uh, indications there. You can change the temperature for the... Uh, either the cockpit or the uh, cabin using these controls here and you can see the cabin temperature selectors cabin supply so that's the air supply into the cabin that's the actual cabin temp this is all in degrees C and uh, you can monitor that way if people think it's too uh, too cold or too hot another A cars message Crew message. Dear crew, please be advised. Convective segment zero one one area is moving from. So this is, I think, this is what we're flying around right now. It's actually giving us a, a weather update. Yeah, Tucson, uh, Dove Creek, I think that is. That might be Battle Mountain. Just expected. Refer to most recent. Yeah, see, that's just really cool. This ACARS thing is actually pretty... And again, this is all working with Active Sky that I have. So if you don't have Active Sky, I don't think you're going to get any of this. But it's pretty cool that it does this. How are we doing going around this cell? Eh, not too bad. We need to go a little further before we uh, turn in again. But we're staying out of the turbulence, so that's good. I think I'll just bring you guys back when we're ready to make the uh, the turn, so we won't. Uh, we'll skip ahead a little bit here. Okay, so we've uh, passed through the weather. We're gonna have to bust through right here, no matter what, because there's a line of everything. It's mostly green and speckled with yellow, so we'll get a little bit of turbulence right there, and we let the passengers know about that. So uh, we're gonna do that right now, but. Uh, so we need to get toward uh, TXO. So we're going to say direct intercept, and we're actually going to pick because now we pass those other two points. So we're going to pick TXO and put it in there. And see how it drew the blue line right there? We're going to execute that. And then we come back up here, hit nav, and it will now track us direct to TXO. So we don't have to do that stupid let's go find our old line kind of nonsense. So. So that's a nice little help. It's uh, getting dark here as we uh, head east in the evening, so I'll show you how we uh, get some light on in here. So we already have our things lit up, and this is a this is a personal call. Obviously, right now it's not dark enough to warrant it necessarily. Uh, I would turn these up on over here, um, but when it gets really dark and you can't see anything, it really is hard to see some other peripheral switches in the cockpit without. And so um, I like to turn up a little bit of light. So what I do is I think it's this knob here, yeah. We'll just turn that on slightly. I don't want to turn it on too much because we don't want to blind ourselves, obviously. And I'll turn that one on a little bit. And then we'll do the same thing with the center. Also, noticing that uh, we need to get those up because of lighting issues. <laughs> and then uh, right here is the, the center flood. And I'll usually go up to about noon with it. Uh, to get enough light to extend down there and also provide some over here. 
So that'll generally be enough light to provide without having to get too insane with the lighting. Sometimes I'll also, just because this can get really dark up here, I'll turn on a little bit of this just to provide a little bit of extra glow up here. But, I mean, you could go really ham with this if you wanted to, but um, I'm not going to do that right now because, again, there's no need to. So that weather radar is very helpful. So it's uh, 134 Zulu right now. Let's uh, We can use our FMC to find out how we're doing on our timing. If you go over here to progress on the FMC, um, we'll see that uh, uh, our estimated uh, time at uh, TXO is uh, 155. we got 162 miles to go. we got 478 miles to go to DFW still, and we're expected to arrive at 247 Zulu. And it, what did I say? It was 135. So that's about an hour and 10 minutes from now is when we should be arriving in uh, Fort Worth. Uh, this tells us the expected amount of fuel. We should have 13.3 thousand pounds. Our reserves, if you recall, were 9.8. So that still gives us plenty of contingency fuel to try a uh, go around before we'd have to divert to Houston, which is our alternate. Uh, looking at some other things that are uh, obviously we've got the legs page, which is our, our normal way of looking at it. Uh, the cruise page, this is something I'll usually bump up. I actually planned on doing this, and I forgot to do it. Uh, the econ speed for this right now is uh, telling us to do Mach 0.74. Uh, this thing will do up to Mach 0.79 and almost 0.8. So I usually run it a little bit faster because I can. And so I'm actually going to change this to Mach 0.78 to give us a little bit of speed boost. And once we execute that, you notice here comes the thrust it's going to now try and hold Mach 0.78. So we're still below the barber pole, so we'll be fine for that. And uh, now, in reality, what I probably would have done, and I, because it's green and I, I really don't care, I'm more concerned about speed right now, uh, knowing we were going to go into weather, I would have actually held back with that decision until after we punched through, because in turbulence, you don't want to risk overspeeding the aircraft suddenly because you're so close to the barber pole when you hit turbulence. So... Uh, you would back speed off a little bit to do that, but uh, it's a sim and I don't care, so we're going to punch through anyway. But this allow us to, to increase our, our time a little bit. Uh, it probably won't show too much of a difference. Well, you already saved two minutes by, by doing that now. So, and our fuel didn't really change, so that's good too. Um... Descent page, so you could set uh, speed transition altitudes here if you wanted to do something else. Uh, this is where you could do that at. Um, I'm wondering if in forecast, yeah, you'd set your your transition altitude uh, different here in forecast if it uh, if it was different than 180, which it's not, so we don't care. Um, if you need to go directly to a fix, you could do that. You can. Uh, use the holding system here so if we were going to hold at a particular waypoint they would give us the the fix to hold at they would give us the the quadrant and the radial and uh or they would give us the the the, the left turns right turns and the heading we could set it for a, a time leg or a distance leg and then an effective uh, release time and uh and then we would set the uh, best speed to hold that leg at as well as the uh, target speed and altitude so uh, once you do all that you could uh, you could execute that and the aircraft would uh, would do the holding pattern automatically until uh, you were done with it uh, so we have a master caution now and that's probably the center fuel tank yep center fuel tank is dry so we go up here and we just turn off and it'll tell us right here center fuel pressure low we just turn off the center pumps and those go off and that's a good excuse to check our fuel temperatures uh, looks like our fuel temperatures are actually doing okay. We're at uh, 20 degrees C on the fuel temp. Uh, it's minus 5 on the RAT and minus 33 on the static. So this is something you just want to keep in mind. It's especially uh, important uh, the closer you get to your destination because that's the longer they've been up at uh, high cruise altitudes uh, cold soaking. So, uh, And actually, we may not... Um, this may be when we first start to see that because we were burning the center tank down. Uh, there's not really fuel flowing through those fuel filters uh, yet. So uh, as the fuel now begins to flow through there because it's pulling from those side tanks, we might start to see those numbers start to drop a little more rapidly 
as it pulls in colder and colder fuel toward those fuel filters. Uh, the fuel heat switches, which are right here, um, basically what that will do is it will turn on a fuel heater for a minute on each of the fuel filters, and you'll see these numbers increase quite dramatically, and then they will automatically cycle off. So you'll, you'll hit these on, and they will just spring back to off. It will have activated the fuel heat for a minute cycle, that when that minute ends, then you'll see the temperature start to fall back again, and you just keep watching the fuel. If the fuel gets into an airshoe uh, of freezing temperatures again, you just hit those fuel heaters again. But they're not designed to stay on, so they will they will flip down and flip right back up. Just know that that's a uh, that's normal operation, and not a uh, not a design flaw. So uh, we've got right about an hour uh, before arrival. Uh, when we get uh, within top of descent range, we'll do the arrival brief. And so usually what I'll do is I'll look at the progress page. Uh, right in here, we'll at a, I think it's about 200 miles out from top of drop or top of descent. Uh, it will tell you the expected time and distance from the top of descent point. When that goes active, somewhere in there between, uh, between 200 and 100 uh, nautical miles from top of drop, is usually when I'll perform my uh, arrival brief, and that's when we'll look at our weather for the uh, for Dallas. Uh, we'll go over the star, and we'll go over the uh, the approach, expected approach anyway. We'll make sure our numbers are plugged in. We'll start to configure the airplane, and uh, and get ready for the uh, the arrival phase of the uh, of the flight. This cockpit really is just absolutely beautiful in 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 the dusk hours. I mean, just look at this. It's just gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Get some nice views of the uh, of the evening sky over here from the wings. We actually could turn on the uh, the logo light now because it's going to be dark enough when we get to uh, Dallas to see what that looks like. So there's the logo light on. You see that illuminated on the tail. So. All right. Well, I will uh, see you guys back here when we uh, get ready to do our arrival brief. All right, welcome back. We are um, approaching our top of drop, and we're at the point where we need to do our uh, approach briefing. You see down here, uh, we are uh, 139 miles from uh, the top of drop point, and we are currently uh, 21 miles from Turkey, which is the beginning of the star. So uh, we'd be uh, we need to go over our approach brief and make sure we have everything uh, squared away and ready to go. So to do that, we're going to uh, go over to our uh, tablet again. Again, this is not part of the aircraft. This is something I do for my stream, but uh, basically just looking at my other monitor uh, navigraph. And so I'll pull this up for you guys to see. And this is the, uh, uh, the what do you call it? The, uh, per the star, the, uh, trying to figure out what, uh, there it is. <laughs> looking for the name of it. I can't remember the name of this thing killing me here. Victory, that's what it's, yeah, good group, there it is, Victory 2 <laughs> Arrival. Uh, so uh, we confirm we have the right uh, arrival uh, chart number here. Uh, we're coming from Turkey, which is our uh, our, our transition point, and uh, basically just showing us uh, the direction we're going to go, but we have a number of, of uh, uh, restrictions. So uh, at Wilter, we have to uh, be between flight level 300 and flight level 240, and no faster than, and at 290 knots. So, uh, we're going to check our FMC here in a second and make sure all this is here. At Ruger, 290 knots, and at or above, at or above flight level 230. Uh, coming down all the way down to here at Glonk, Glock, uh, 290 knots between flight level 190 and 17,000. You notice the flight level changed to altitude when it crossed below uh, 180. Uh, at Lehman, 270 knots between 16,000 and 13,000. At Victory, 250 knots between 11,000 and 10,000. At uh, Zeman, 
250 knots between 9,000 and 7,000. And at this point, um, we're probably going to split. I'm, I'm assuming this is if we're going to continue on and go down there. Let me... Uh, 1718 from Zeman Trek to FOP, yeah. So, um, because we're going to be landing on uh, 17 Center, uh, we would not go this way, we would be going this way to uh, FOP. And at FOP, we need to be at 230 and 5,000. In between the brackets is at that altitude, so 5,000 feet to head on. And then it's vectors, is that vectors point to the approach course. Uh, so we're going to take note of a few things here. We're going to we're going to confirm that our uh, M FMC has all those uh, restrictions in it, but then we're also going to go through and uh, just be aware that uh, once we get inside here, our MSA for this area is 3,600 feet. It's our minimum safety altitude. Airport elevation there, six 600 feet. We did 580, close enough. It was 580 at one of the points. Um, so let's close that. We're going to go to uh, the DFW charts, and we're going to pull up the uh, approach for 17 Center, ILS LOC 17 Center. If you were doing the RNAV, you'd be doing this. If you're doing a different uh, category, but we're going to assume this one for the moment. Um, let's see what, if there's any serious differences here between the Cat 1 and the Cat 2. It's probably just the, oh, we're not doing those. We're just doing the ILS. Yeah, there we go. Okay. It's probably just going to change the decision altitude, heights, and stuff like that. That's probably what's going to happen. Anyway, this is what the approach plate looks like. By the way, these are black because I like the night version better than the uh, day version. This is what the, the JEP charts look by default. And to me, this is unpleasant. <laughs> this is super sharp. <laughs> so I prefer the night version. Um, but we want to verify a few things. So our, our ATIS right here, which we're gonna actually going to get through the, uh, through the uh, ACARS, our localizer frequency, 110.3, and approach course is 176. Uh, there's our MSA is 3,600 feet on this side, but um, we're going to be in the 2,700 foot range, so because we're going to be north of the field, unless we go mist. So we just want to be aware of that. Uh, Bossy and then Penny are our two uh, uh, points before we actually intercept the localizer. And at Bossy, we want to be at 6,000. And actually, our uh, star ends us at 5,000, so we don't really care about Bossy, which, again, this is why we don't always put the transition point in. Penny actually makes more sense to be our transition point because we're going to be at 5,000 from the star. Uh, so 5,000, Zing at 3,000, Jiffy at 2,300, and then that's our initial approach, uh, initial, our final approach fix, and all the way down. Our minimums are 200 feet above the ground or 762 feet um, above the actual runway uh, for this one. So um, this will be using decision height. Um, so we'll be putting in 200 into the, uh, the category there. And then uh, we also want to be aware of our missed approach procedure, uh, which we can go up here and see this. Climb on a heading of 176 to cross uh, uh, Pru. 2.8 miles from the uh, ILS uh, at or below 3,000 and then climbing right turn to 4,000 outbound on the TTT VOR radial 176 to JASPA uh, intersection which is 35 uh, DME from TTT and hold or as directed by AGC and that shows you right there we hold that to 3,000 to 2.6 um, on uh, to UPRU and then or sorry 2.8 and then it's a uh, turn to uh, intercept the 176 radial off Maverick, and then we fly 35 miles out from Maverick, which is the uh, uh, Jasper point, which is right there. Um, or we'll just turn around and come back in, since we don't have uh, ATC to, to guide us otherwise. Uh, upon landing, we'll look at the, uh, the taxi here. Uh, we're coming on 17 center. By the time we stop, uh, probably won't make that. <laughs> it's pretty close. So uh, I would guess uh, M3, M4, uh, and EL and Echo Lima are all uh, options for us. Um, ultimately, we'll take uh, 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 Mike here to Echo Lima, or Echo Mike at the worst case scenario, and we'll come in here. We're going to be parking at the uh, at the Charlie Gates today. Uh, specifically, let's uh, look at uh, what gate we want to go to on the Charlie Gates. And I think uh, for our purposes today, we will plan on Charlie, 
Uh, I think Charlie 15 actually is a, actually Charlie gate I've actually been to and was an MD80 on that gate. So we'll plan for Charlie 15. So that's our taxi in. Uh, we're going to be doing flaps 28 today for our uh, landing. And yeah, so I'm going to go back to the star and turn off the tablet so you guys can see me confirm this stuff. So let's go tablet off. And we're going to basically go down to the legs page here and make sure that it has the restrictions that we're supposed to have. So our first one is at Willer or Wilter. 290 between 240 and 300, that's correct. Then Ruger, 290 uh, at or above 230, that's correct. Uh, Glock, 290 between 17 and 19, that is correct. Uh, Lehman, 270 between 13 and 16, uh, that is correct. And Victory, 250, 10 and 11, that is correct. Zeman, 250 between 7 and 9, that is correct. And FOP 230 at 5,000, that's correct. Then we have our vectors, and then it's, uh, uh, let's see, I need to pull up the approach, 17 center, because it's going straight to Zing. So it's actually bypassing Penny altogether, which is fine. Um, so in fact, let's just remove the vectors. Since we don't have ATC, we don't have to worry about that. So we're just going to go straight from FOP to Zing. And that's 3,000 and above, and that is uh, the correct point for Zing, 3,000. And then Jiffy, 2,300. And then we're on the approach. Uh, next page, and then runway 17. And then this has the uh, correct info for the missed approach. So that is all correct. So the next thing we're going to want to do is uh, we're going to want to select in for the top of descent. Uh, the the lowest point on the star, which was 5,000. So we're going to set this down to 5,000 and pull it. So we get 5,000 right there. We're going to confirm we're on VNAV level. So we're on VNAV, so it will go down. If this says something else, like altitude hold, uh, it's not going down when we hit top of drop. This needs to be on VNAV and uh, FMS speed, and it's tracking the nav track right now, so that's good too. Uh, the other thing we want to do is set up the uh, ILS frequency so that's 110.3 110.3 we'll set there and the final approach course is 176 which is convenient because that's not very far from what it is set to now so our ILS is set right there uh, I'm gonna set in the number two box uh, Maverick which is 113.1 for the missed approach that's TTT so that is 113.1 and that is the 176 radial off of Maverick so it's basically a runway heading but over a bit to line ourselves up with the uh, Maverick VOR. So if we have to do that, we're going to rely on this, but if something was to fail, we've got stuff queued up to uh, be able to switch over very easily in the event we had a problem. So uh, the idea is you want to plan for the worst and expect the best. Uh, we're going to plan for um, a minimum auto brake because uh, we've got plenty of runway today. So we don't need to go uh, hammer and tongs on the brakes. If it was a short field, we'd uh, do that differently, but it's not, so we won't. And the last thing I want to do here as part of this uh, approach brief is we want to check the ATIS for DFW, so current weather. Uh, so we're going to go over here to menu. We're going to go to the A cars, and we're going to check our, uh, do a request, a weather, an ATIS request for K D F W and it's gonna be an arrival ATIS we're gonna send that and we're gonna wait till we hear the ding there it is receive messages there's our ATIS DFW arrival ATIS arrival runway 17 left 17 right 17 center 18 right 18 left so we're taking 17 center so that's good Transition level, flight level 180, wind is 150 at 9 or knots, 10 mile visibility, few clouds at uh, 30,000 feet, temperature 32, 2.16, and uh, altimeter 29 or 89 er So uh, I'm just going to make a note of that for the 29 or 89 er because on a, on a digital Boeing, I could set that and then just hit a button to switch it, but we can't set it until we're ready to actually use it. So, um, so yeah. 
Um, the winds, though, 150 at Niner. We're coming in on 176, so it's a little bit off the nose. So we're going to have about a uh, about a we'll call it we'll call it an eight knot. Well, we'll call it a seven. It's actually better to err on the side of knot. So that's probably about a seven knot headwind or so. It's not too far off the nose. And uh, so we'll assume the uh, V ref speed plus uh, it'd be half the wind. So that would be, but at least plus, but at least five. So uh, normally it'd be about three and a half knots added to V ref, but we do at least five, and then beyond that if the winds warrant it. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna do a plan our V ref as V ref plus five for our approach speed. All right, and that concludes our approach brief. So we're all ready for that. And we should be descending now in. Oh, we're not in menu. That's right. I'm going to go back to the FAMC. Progress. Uh, should be descending in about 33 miles. We'll start our descent. And everything else is looking good. And we'll, uh, we'll be back on the descent. Uh, we're not uh, quite to top of top yet. We're about 16 miles from there, but I, I'm just noticing. I want to show you this. The uh, the the fuel temperature has dropped now. You remember it was about 20 when we were uh, first reaching cruise, and it's now about five and five and five looks like on each side, or is that five and six? Yeah, five and six. So it's getting close. I mean, and this one just dropped to four. It'll it'll go back and forth. It'll fluctuate. So I'm just gonna hit the fuel heaters just to show you what this looks like when you do this. And so, notice they both click down, but you get these fuel heat indicators right there to let you know it actually worked. And right away, you see the fuel temperature is going up. And this is because it's not heating the fuel in the tanks, it's heating the fuel at the fuel filter. And so it can heat up very quickly because it's basically heating up that fuel filter right there. So, uh, basically what that does is it allows it to melt any, uh, if any water has condensed into the fuel, uh, if the water freezes, the, the, temp the freezing temperature of fuel is like minus 45 or something like that centigrade, but the freezing temperature of water is minus zero, is zero, <laughs> just zero. So uh, what this does is if, uh, if water freezes in the fuel, then that can cause ice that can block the fuel filter and starve the engines of fuel and you get an engine flame out. Not good. So this basically heats up the uh, the fuel at the fuel filters, allows any ice that may have formed there to melt, and prevents a, uh, a fuel blockage at that point. So that's all that's happening. And it looks like we're going to get to witness uh, top of drop here in uh, three miles. So again, we're just going to verify. We've got uh, VNAV level right there. Uh, that's set, and uh, our new altitude is selected there. So we'll not descend below that point, and uh, we should watch. We should get a... Um, there it is. When we hit drop a drop, we get a um, a profile indication. The uh, throttles are going to start to roll back, and as this uh, the aircraft will do its level best to try and hold that thing in the middle there, uh, as the uh, aircraft starts to pitch down. <coughs> so as long as you set it up correctly, then you don't. There's nothing you have to do to initiate the top of dr the uh, top of descent. But you have to set it up correctly, if, and you really have to watch that because if you pass through top of descent, thinking it's going to drop on its own and it doesn't, uh, you can easily get, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles uh, into your descent profile and still be at your cruise altitude, and now you're way high, and uh, it's really hard to lose airspeed and altitude at the same time. So uh, you end up having to sacrifice one for the other. And either means you're going to have to like do a loop to loop around to, to lose uh, uh, lose uh, uh, altitude, or you're going to have to hope you get down fast enough so you can bleed off speed before it's too late and come in too fast. It all leads to end up being behind the airplane. You don't want to do that. So, uh, so the descent has started. I'm going to pull up the descent checklist because uh, we already went through the descent stuff. Uh, there's some things that we're not going to be able to do on the descent checklist because we're not low enough yet. But um, so we're just going to take a note of these. So. Uh, the MSA we did note was uh, um, 3,600 feet for the uh, side we're going to be on. Uh, approach and landing briefing has been completed. Uh, the landing data uh, is not quite yet confirmed. We could do that now. It 
maybe a little early. I usually don't like to do this until we're about uh, 15,000 feet or so, but uh, we'll go ahead and do it for the sake of. If you click down here, it'll switch this uh, placard to the landing data placard, and you'll see our landing weight there, and you'll see our, uh, our VREF speeds, basically, of... Uh, let me see. Let's see what this. Let's go around. Flat projection. Yeah. So our our VREF speeds here um, for the configuration uh, 28 uh, flaps 28 is a 147, and we're going to add five to that for our own purposes for flying the airplane uh, to compensate for uh, for any fluctuation in wind. So uh, 152 is actually our VREF, and then 147 would be our like final landing speed. Um, but now that that is there, we can go ahead and click over here. These will cycle back up and then reset, and they are now set correctly. So this bug, though, it was set to that bug, the 147, not 152. So we're going to try and keep the speed not at that bug, but we'd keep the speed a little bit above that bug for our landing um, to compensate for that. All right. <clears throat> And so we got the bugs there to start uh, dropping in slats and then more flaps and, and the like as we come down. So the v, uh, landing data is confirmed and V-bugs was the other part of that is now set as well. Uh, radio altimeter is uh, not set up because we can't do that until we drop below uh, 180. So normally I like to wait at least until we're below there, but so we'll wait for a second on that one. And then hydraulic system check and set. So at the uh, descent here we can go ahead over to the first officer side, we're going to set the hydraulic pumps. No, don't turn them off. <laughs> we're going to set the hydraulic pumps back to high and the aux and trans back on. Again, this is all just in case something cuts out on landing. You don't want to be uh, short any air hydraulics. So uh, the electric pump will take over if the engine pumps fail or whatever it is. So, And then pressurization checked and set. So we can do the pressurization. We got the altimeter setting of a 2 or 8 niner. And so we're going to go up here to the pressurization and uh, 2 9 or 8 9 -er. It's a little bit different than what we originally set, so we're going to change that there. But the uh, field elevation, we're going to leave the same. So that is all set to go. We have an MCDU message saying drag required. So we're going to come over here and we're going to, uh, nope, not do that. We're going to actually uh, put out the spoiler and help the aircraft descend a little bit. In the real world, you would constantly keep your hand on that speed brake as long as it was armed, as long as it's deployed, um, because it's so easy to forget that it's there, that it's that it's on, and so you don't want to do that. So, once the speed drops below that uh, margin there, then we go ahead and put that back. Uh, we are approaching. Uh, what waypoint are we approaching? Oh, let through them. Okay, so 290. Yeah, so we're still okay. Um, we're actually, actually, sorry, we're approaching. Uh, yeah, layman. So two. So we're gonna get a 270 restriction here in a little bit. It's gonna go back down, and we're just about to hit underneath the uh, 18,000 feet uh, transition. So we'll change that to. Uh, there it is. So we'll change this to 29 or 89 or. And we'll change this one to 29 or 89 or. And we'll change this one to 2 or 8 There we go. So the altimeters are now set. And pressurization is checked and set. Landing data is confirmed. So the descent checklist is now complete. So the next thing is the approach checklist. And uh, basically this is where we would confirm. Uh, you could do this at any time below 18,000 feet. Um, I would probably do this around uh, 15 or so, uh, is how my standard is. And that's uh, cabin signs, fuel system altimeters, and then also uh, landing lights you bring on below 10, uh, they need to be on by 10,000 feet. I bring them on at about 15, uh, or at least extend them and then bring them, down short, bring them on shortly thereafter. We're going to uh, increase the or decrease the range on this a little bit so we can see better what's going on here. Uh, 
Um, cabin signs, I ended up just leaving them on the whole time because of the weather we ran into. But uh, normally, as we get it close here, we would uh, turn those cabin signs on to indicate to the uh, cabin crew that not only do we want the passengers to be seated, but they need to start wrapping things up for uh, uh, and preparing things for landing. Okay, so you know, after the fuel heater went back off, the temperature went right back, kind of right back down again. Or close to it, because all it was doing was heating up the uh, fuel filter, not heating up the fuel itself. So more cold fuel coming behind it. So if you were in a situation to actually need to do that, you would just kind of want to keep an eye on that constantly and be watching that. But you notice our outside air temperature is now above uh, freezing. It's up to 14 degrees Celsius on the on the uh, skin temperature, and we're right at zero. It looks like on the uh, on the static so yes yeah, so we're right at freezing on the outside level so that's 15,000 so at this point I would uh, extend the uh, the landing lights that'll also help uh, provide a little bit of a cushion to slow us down you notice we are uh, now holding the uh, 270 on the speedo and our next restriction at victory I believe is 250 you just want to keep verifying this make sure you don't bust your limits we also need to be below um, 11,000 feet and above 10,000 feet at victory. So we're, we're well on our way to being there and making that uh, transition. So at this point, I think we, were, we would be good to say uh, with the uh, approach checklist, cabin signs are on. The fuel system is set. I mean, we're not doing anything different. The, uh, the left and right tanks are on. And uh, uh, you could also, with the fuel system, uh, Use this, I would usually do this below 10,000, but you could use this as the opportunity to set this to uh, both your uh, continuous ignition, basically, ignition system. And the altimeter is set, 2989er, and cross checked, and the bugs are all set. So the approach checklist is complete, and uh, we're just waiting on the uh, uh, landing checklist then, which actually has the, uh, the engine ignition selector. So. I would normally do that below 10,000, just to get in the habit. But you'll double check that as part of the landing checklist when we get to that point. And it's wanting us to add drag again, so we're gonna we're gonna do that. You keep seeing it lift up first. That's because I've got two different buttons set on my yoke: one for arming it, and one for um, re um, raising the spoilers. And I always forget which one's which, so. <laughs> So as we hit our speed target, we put that back in so we don't lose too much uh, speed. And we're now within our limits for victory. Victory, we need to be between 11 and 10. We're at 10, 9, so we're good. And speed is on. And we're starting our turn over toward uh, Zeman. And Zeman, we got to be between uh, 9,000 and 7,000 and uh, 250 knots. So speed's going to come back in here as it's uh, trying to maintain that speed. And we're about to go below 10,000, so we're going to switch the landing lights actually on now. Uh, by the way, the auto brake, so the auto brake is set to minimum, but I can't arm it yet. I can do that, but it just retracts back. The flaps has to be at least at 28 before you can arm the auto brake in the air. So uh, we can set the auto brake setting to what we want, but we can't actually arm them until the flaps uh, come down to 28. So just be aware of that. This is why it's so important to, to do the approach briefing and have all this stuff dialed in because things are going to start to happen really quickly now. You're going to be managing a lot of things with the speed and, uh, and the trajectory of the aircraft and basically making sure that everything's where it is. And if you're not ahead of the airplane in that regard, then you can get behind real fast and you end up overshooting your localizer or other things. So it's uh, always super important to, to know where your aircraft is supposed to be and, and thinking ahead of it, what's coming next in the... Uh, order of operations here. So in fact I'm watching the speed go above the, the set line there so I'm just I'm not gonna wait for the MC MCDU to tell me I'm gonna help it along and pull those uh, spoilers out. 
And there's 9,000, so we're in the uh, window for uh, Zeman. And you notice we're right on profile, so we're right where the uh, FMC thinks we should be. Uh, anytime during the uh, descent, really below 10,000 feet, is a good time to go ahead and switch this from cruise to go around. And so you see it just makes our uh, EPR setting that much more, uh, that high, much higher, so we have uh, room to really increase uh, power should we need it in a moment's notice. Again, don't forget those toga buttons are right here. That's take off, go around. So if you ever need to click it to to activate uh, toga power, like I said, I have it set to my uh, throttle quadrant. I have a button available on there, so I can do it there. But All right, we hit Zeman, and we're coming up to uh, uh, FOP now which uh, is the 5,000 limit. And at this point, I'm now going to set, because we're, we're almost to the end of the star, I'm going to go ahead and set this down to about 2,000, which is a little bit below uh, where the glide slope intercept is, and hit that button. So that way it doesn't just stop us at 5,000 and we stop descending. You want to do that early enough so it, it doesn't like stop that profile before it's... Because otherwise you have to hit re-hit VNAV and kind of recycle it, and it's a pain in the butt. So by this point, uh, you would already have the passengers seated. You'd be uh, telling the flight attendants to make final preparations for landing. And uh, under uh, under 5,000 feet, you'd probably be telling, telling them to take their seats. We've got 13,000 uh, pounds of fuel right now. If you recall, our, uh, our uh, reserves amount was uh, 9.8. So basically what that means, when we hit 9.8, that's when we have to divert to our uh, alternate. So we've got enough fuel for uh, at least a go-around attempt before we'd have to head over to the alternate. That's an interesting little anomaly there <laughs> that just showed up. Thankfully, it's not doing anything with that, but it's kind of weird. So you notice, even when the computer moves the uh, stabilizer trim, it still gives you the uh, aura alert. And again, that's just so you know the stabilizer is moving. It has nothing to do with whether or not it should move. It's all about just letting you know it is moving, and you need to know that. All right, so basically we're on our uh, course now to intercept the localizer. So I've got the uh, ILS uh, notification here, so I think it's detecting that that's what that is. Um, we do not have a glide slope yet, obviously. And that's okay. We come into Dallas. So at this point, we're about 10 miles from intercepting the uh, the localizer, and we're below 240. So I'm going to go ahead and put out the uh, the slats.
And then we have 11, 15, and then 28. So there's only three more positions we're going to go through for the flaps. But those last ones we won't do until our speed is uh, significantly lower than what it is right now. And I won't do a full auto land with this. We will use the automation to capture the glide slope. Uh, so I can show you how that works and make sure the ILS is uh, captured. And then uh, once we've got a good visual of the runway, then I'll take command uh, manually and we'll fly it in that way. Because it's the Mad Dog really is a fun aircraft to fly. So you, you want to you wanna be able to use the automation. I mean, ultimately, you want to be able to use the automation so you can use it when you need it. But, you know, fly the bird as much as you can. All right, so now we can see we've got the glide slope and the localizer ready to go. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to um, select VOR loc, and it's it goes orange, meaning it's waiting to capture. So it hasn't captured yet. Green means it's actually captured things. So And if we see that thing start to swing in, then I'll go ahead and hit the ILS button. Because right now, VOR loc is not going to do anything with the, uh, the glide slope. It's only going to try and capture the localizer. But I don't want to miss the localizer, the glide slope either. So, Which it's looking like it's starting to come down. Because we might be intercepting it right at Zing. I think we are. So I'm actually going to go ahead and hit the uh, arm the ILS. So that says ILS there. So we know that's... It's good to capture both the glide slope and the localizer. And you see our speed is now dropping back when we get down to about uh, at least under 200 there, closer to 180. We'll go ahead and put flaps 11 in. At this point, we'll go ahead and arm the uh, spoiler. And we should be swinging to capture the glide slope any moment. Oh, the uh, localizer, rather, any second. Now, here it goes. So there's capturing the localizer. That's our runway right there, 17 center. That's left, that's right. So you want to make sure you know which runway you're actually landing on. It's easy to confuse that sometimes at Fort Worth, especially when one's way separated from the other one. And we'll now go ahead and do uh, flaps 11. As it captures the rest of the, it's kind of swinging long here. We'll go ahead and put the gear down for some extra drag. You can see the ILS is not doing the, the fanciest job right now, but it, it'll bring us in eventually. Now, we're getting ABS light because the auto brake is not armed. And so we're going to go flaps 15. And we'll actually do flaps 28 now. And as that comes into flaps 28, we can arm this. There we go. That ABS light goes off. And we see landing gears down, three green flaps and slats are extended, 28. Speed brake lever is armed, auto brake is, is armed, engine ignition selector is both. Landing checklist complete. Autopilot, Autopilot disengaged, it's my aircraft. And when we had been given clearance to land, we would turn the nose light on as a kind of a memory item to say, yep, we do have landing clearance. 1,000. And now we're just watching. You can use the uh, ILS uh, for reference down there, but uh, keep an eye on those pappies. Remember, two white, two red is right where you want to be. Too many whites, you're too high. Too many reds, and you are dead. 
And we're going to bring the speed back a little bit because we're a little bit uh, beyond our V-Ref. And we're a little high, so too fast Five, and too nine. high is not where we want to be. There, we can bring that Pappy back in. Four hundred. Bring a little bit of speed back up as we realign with that. Using the rudder to correct for any uh, any wind adjustment. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. Speed to idle. And touchdown. And once the nose is down, forward pressure and pull the reverse. Want to make sure you got nose wheel contact before you hit those reversers, or if you go the wrong way, you can have a problem. I'll, I had an issue in Newark like that, and that was not pretty. All right, 60 knots. We'll go uh, idle reverse and out. This is uh, Mike 4. I saw the taxi sign there. And so we will pull up here. We tap the brakes a little bit to disconnect the uh, auto brake so it doesn't take us all the way to zero. So we can smoothly taxi off. We will turn off the landing lights. Taxi light can go to dim. And we will now take this down. We'll take Mike down to, uh, I think it was Echo Lima. Want to make sure the uh, flaps get pulled back in. And the uh, flaps will not let you pull in the spoil the uh, um, the slats until. Actually, was that uh, was that Echo Lima? That might have been Echo Lima. <laughs> I didn't think Mike Four ended at Echo Lima, but maybe it did. That's okay. We can always taxi back. Yeah, it did. We just went past. So we're going to add Echo Mike. All right, that's fine. We'll survive. Um, we do want to select. Our parking facility, we're going to go to Charlie, Charlie 15. And again, if you were talking to air traffic control, you'd be getting your taxi clearances for this, so they would tell you where to go. We can turn off the uh, flight director at this point. Because we don't need to worry about that. We can also turn off the auto brake. It's disengaged anyway. And we can kill that. And I think we're going to go the next one in here, which is Lima. Yeah. So, yeah, so it won't let you bring up the slats until the flaps have come all the way up. And so now that that's happened, we can bring up the uh, lever to the last uh, detent there. We're going to turn over here onto Lima to go up to Charlie because these are the Delta gates, I think. Alpha Charlie, or maybe they're the Echo gates. Either way, we're going to the Charlie Gate, so. So you can turn the uh, engine ignition system back to off. Uh, we could also could start the uh, APU just to make things easier. So um, I always do the start pump on just to be safe, and we'll do the... APU master and hold to start. Make sure I'm still looking where I'm going. We're still holding that left mouse button until I see the uh, the engine exhaust gas temperature start to rise up there, like I do there, so we can let that go. APU will be started, so we can start that up right at the gate. We can turn the uh, transponder away from uh, TARA and just back to uh, transponder mode, because we don't need traffic alerts on the ground. That can be obnoxious when you have traffic. Uh, we're checking our brake temperatures are, are okay. We're right about uh, two there. If that little red light comes on, that's when you know you've got overheated brakes. But we didn't land heavy and we didn't land uh, hard, so uh, we didn't expect to have uh, an overheat situation. It looks like there's our uh, 
ground handling services over there for uh, Charlie 15. I'm going to turn the uh, strobes off and I'm going to turn the uh, the wing lights on only because we're going to turn the corner here and have to turn off the uh, Oh, there it is. Now I see them. Actually, wait, is it... Is it that one, or is it that one? That's Charlie 14, it's this one. I was off by one. I'm going to stare down this van. So we're going to turn off the taxi light so we don't blind them as we go in. And we've got it actually in an auto, auto gate guy here, which is cool, so... Don't have to worry about the dumb marshal or being hidden in the building or something. Alright, that's apparently where it wants us. <laughs> so that guy will come out pretty far. Alright, so parking brake set. And now we can flip over to the uh, APU gen. And it's not going to take until um, we turn off the generators, but uh, you notice we've got it available, so we know it's there. Uh, I'm actually going to turn on the dome light right there. And we will cut and cut. We would turn off the uh, seatbelt sign at this point. We turn off the pedos. We turn off the fuel pumps. And that's why we got the start pump on for the APU. We could tell ground handling to go ahead and connect up the ground yes, power unit. APU, please. Stand by. Connect yes, the low sir. pressure air, please. And connect the low pressure air. And we'll tell GSX to operate the jetway, which it will do. Here it comes. Snaking out towards us. Okay, here comes pressure. I'm gonna turn on our floodlights, and we'll turn off our beacon because the engines are now off. We'll retract. Whoops, retract the landing lights, not turn them on. And I always do this for the next guy. I turn, I open up the uh, pneumatic cross feeds again. We'll turn off the transponder because we're here. And uh, we definitely should turn off, I should have done that when we were taxiing in, turn off the weather radar. <laughs> Something I always forget. And those flight directors are already off. The jetway is here, so we can go up here to open the doors. Doors and stairways, we'll open that. We'll open all three of the cargo holds. And then we can tell GSX to request deboarding. And then we look at our parking uh, checklist. Fuel tank pump switches are off. Aux, aux and, and uh, trans hydraulic pumps uh, can now, actually all the pumps can go off now. So we'll do that and that. And the parking brake is set. And actually now that the uh, beacons are off, um, we can actually, we, that means the GSX, not GSX, but uh, Leonardo has put the chocks on. So we can actually release the parking brake, and that will help the brakes to cool uh, rather than holding them on, because we just use the little chocks to do the job. Uh, the last part of this, whoa, that was the fastest deboarding in history. What the heck was that? Da dang. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then when you're uh, securing the aircraft, this is after the passengers are off, uh, the, uh, leaving the airplane checklist is emergency lights, APU, and the battery switch. So basically you would go through and flip all the switches that you turned on. Um, so basically you just go in reverse order. We've got uh, air supplied by the external now. And we can switch over to that. So we can switch to external power. I can actually kill the uh, APU and the start pump subsequently. We can turn off the uh, windshield anti-ice. Um, we can unlock the cockpit door. The yaw damper can go off. The uh, anti-skid can go off. Uh, logo light will leave on for the time being. And 
I think that's everything in the overhead panel that we need to worry about as far as turning off. You could go through and turn off your lights and turn off your uh, various uh, displays here if you wanted to. I, I don't know if we'll bother with that because it'll turn off when I kill the battery. <laughs> Uh, but we make sure all that's up and off and done. Uh, that's fully off. The auto brake's off. And that's pretty much it. And then I've got the floodlights on outside, so you can see the... I don't think I've ever actually turned them on when I've been out here, but you can see the... There's the floods right there. And, uh, the wing lights over here, so you get a little bit of extra light around the, uh, around the aircraft. But uh, we got a good amount of light being supplied by uh, Dallas right now, so it's not really a big deal. But that's it. That is the uh, the MD-80 and how to operate it. So uh, hopefully this was helpful. Um, again, uh, I stream on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays uh, on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv slash Mustafa. You see the, uh, uh, the link there in the times. Uh, come in, stop by. We fly uh, not only this aircraft, but a number of other aircraft, including the 747, the 777, uh, 737, uh, 727 in X-Plane, 757 in either X-Plane or P3D. Uh, and uh, we try to do all these procedures every time. So if you, uh, you want to see how I fly these things, uh, we try to keep it uh, fairly realistic and we're, we're not goofing around too much. Uh, things do happen sometimes and we have a good time, but... Uh, it's it's all about simulating the uh, the realism as best we can. So uh, one last thing, we can check down here real quick. Uh, if we go to menu, we go to our A cars. We can look at our flight log, and it should have our uh, in time. So our our out time was 43 Zulu off 47. We were on at 2:43, and we are in the gate at 2:49. So again, for virtual airline stuff, that could be really helpful for uh, getting those numbers and seeing that. So yeah. Hope this was educational for you. I hope it helped. Uh, I know this aircraft is super complex, but again, when you break it down where the systems are and what you got to do when and why, it actually starts to make a lot of sense. And it actually is a joy to fly this plane. I This this literally has become my new 737 uh, kind of go-to aircraft when I want something just kind of fun and, and simple but complex. I want something complex, but I don't want it to be a huge, giant airliner. This is just an easy thing for me to get in now and boot up and and fly, and it's just it's just a lot of fun. Uh, Leonardo did a fantastic job with this. They're constantly making improvements. Uh, there's an MD-88 version of this and an 83 version of this, which are basically different lengths of fuselages and some different system differences. I don't have those yet. I plan on getting those. So um, learn the base model first. This is the MD-82, and then uh, and then upgrade those as you. Uh, get comfortable with this aircraft but uh it's a it's a fun aircraft to fly if you have not picked it up yet do yourself a favor go to uh search leonardo mad dog x for p3d v4 and grab this aircraft you will not you will not regret it all right that is uh that is it so uh like i said hope you enjoyed it and uh, I'm gonna, if you if you did enjoy, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button here on YouTube, and let me know in the comments if you'd like to see other videos of other aircraft that I have uh, doing this kind of tutorial, just kind of going through the whole thing, because um, I'll I'll make them if there's a desire to. If if no one cares, then why bother? We'll just keep doing what we're doing. Uh, but I have a feeling I've, I've been asked a number of times by some people that I should do some tutorial flights, and uh, so happy to do it and hopefully it was helpful hope to see you around on twitch sometime and uh like i said hit that subscribe button and that uh, like button i would appreciate it it's flying moose mustafa signing off good night